Um, good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you for uh, attending our symposium today. And the first of all, of course, you know, we have to, of course, uh, acknowledge our traditional uh, uh, Aboriginal land owners that called the Gadigo people of Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land which our university is located and where we meet today. We acknowledge their leaders past and present and those who are with us in this exhibition and today's symposium. The land we stand on here always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So uh, we just uh, move on first to uh, panel one. And panel one is called Past and Contemporary Visual Atomic Art. And today's lecturer, we are uh, really honored by um, Yukinori Okamura, curator and a managing director of the Maruki Gallery for Hiroshima panels. Mr. Okamura has been a well-respected leading figure in the field of studies relating to atomic art. In 2015, he took charge of an exhibition tour to the United States, Washington DC, Boston, and New York, Brooklyn, among many of his publications, one stands out is a guide to non-nuclear art from Iwanami booklet series in 2013. A most important book for understanding the development of atomic art from Hiroshima to Fukushima. Mr. Okamura will tell us in his lecture why not anti-nuclear art, but non-nuclear art? He is active oh. in engaging with forefront research on atomic art in Japan. If you look up the website of the <laughs> art gallery, uh, you would be surprised by inspiring innovative new exhibitions while <laughs> maintaining exhibition always of the uh, Hiroshima panels. Just the day before yesterday, 5th May, the Maruki Gallery celebrates 55th anniversary for the opening of the gallery. In 2017, the Maruki Gallery received the prestigious Tanimoto Kiyoshi Award to maintain the legacy of the spirit and the will of the artist Maruki Ili and Toshi. Mr. Okamura is the one who has been carrying out their vision for nuclear free world. Today, he will be talking about past and contemporary visual atomic art. He will be mainly speaking in Japanese today, but he has prepared English super or subtitle subtitles in the screen. Also, we are grateful for Roman Rosenbaum, Honorary Associate of Japanese Studies at the University of Sydney, who will be translating um, your, your uh, attendees, your questions and comments. So please put them in chat quickly as for this, uh, for this reason, because we have a Japanese English um, both uh, to be used in this uh, panel. Thank you. Off to uh, Okamura Sensei, onegai はい、それではよろしくお願いいたします。え、パスアンドコンテンポラリービジュアルアトミックアート。
、えー、本日お話しする内容は2011年3月の東日本大震災と福島第一原発事故をきっかけにした問題意識に基づいています。私の働いている丸木美術館は原爆の図を常設展示しています。原爆の図の作者であるマルキー・リーは1995年にマルキトシは2000年に亡くなっていますが原爆体験をもとに核と人類は共存できないと考えその脅威を伝える絵画を描きき続けてきましたマルキ夫妻だけではなく核の脅威に対抗する芸術表現はこれまで多くのアーティストによって受け継がれてきたのですしかしそれらの芸術が紹介される機会があまりに少ないということに私は2011年にようやく気がつきましたそして確かに存在する芸術の系譜を明らかにするためそれらを比較芸術と呼びましたあちょっと字幕がずれちゃってますすいませんノンニュークリアアート比較芸術と呼びましたハンカクアンチニュークリアが核の使用に反対するのに対し比較ノンニュークリア核の存在そのものを否定するという意味です。比較芸術、ノンニュークリアアートとは、核の脅威に抵抗するだけではなく、核を保有することに価値を置く社会のあり方そのものを再考する芸術と位置づけています。それはすべての人間が人間らしく生き誰にも抑圧されず生命が脅かされることのない普遍的な自由に向けての渇望なのです、えー、1945年7月16日アメリカニューメキシコ州の砂漠で世界で初めての核実験が行われましたその成功は私たちすべての生命が核と隣り合わせに生きなければならない新しい時代の始まりを意味していました核の破壊を最初にイメージした絵画は1936年にダビド・シケイロスが書いた都市の爆発かもしれません、ま、原爆の図の作者のマルキーリー・マルキトシは1958年にシケイロスに「僕は原爆が広島に落ちるより10年前一つの爆弾で都市が燃え上がっている図を描いた」と話しかけられたと回想しています。それは芸術家の想像力が未来を予見した例と言えるでしょう。また、1945年8月6日に広島、8月9日に長崎へ原子爆弾が投下された直後には、サルバドール・ダリがウラニウムと原子による憂鬱な牧歌を描いています。この作品もいち早く核の破壊に反応した想像力と言えます
しかし核被害を描いた芸術が生まれてくるのはもちろん日本です私が働くマルキ美術館はマルキーリマルキ都市の共同制作原爆の図を展示するために画家自身が建てた美術館です今回は原爆の図を軸にしながら核という脅威に向き合い表現した芸術をたどります原爆を描いた画家はマルキ夫妻が最初ではありませんイリとトシは原爆投下の日に広島にいたわけではなく知らせを聞いてから広島に入り悲惨な光景を目撃しましたしかし原爆が投下された時に広島にいてすぐに爆心地に向かった画家もいましたたとえば福井義雄は広島の弊社で被爆し原爆投下から1時間のうちに燃える死骸をスケッチしていますおそらく彼は最初に原爆の絵を描いたのでしょう戦争に敗れた日本は連合国軍に占領されました原爆の写真は没収され報道も検閲されます福井は1947年に焼け跡の風景画を描いていますが人間の体の被害を描いて発表したのは占領から解放された後の1952年でした油彩画炸裂15分後は福井が目撃した被爆者の姿や風景を生々しく再現しています。上範隆は長崎で興味深い絵画を残しました。深見は原爆が投下された8月9日、被爆から3時間後に救援のために爆心地に入っています。翌年の夏、記憶が薄れないうちに描き残したいと考え、身近な紙と水彩を使って1週間で、絵巻物を描きました焼け跡に足を踏み入れた記憶をなぞるように描いた絵巻物は早い時期に絵と言葉で原爆の被害を記録した貴重な例ですが占領下では発表されませんでした深見は1951年被爆の後遺症に苦しみ31歳で自殺しました絵巻が発表されたのは1980年代でしたマルキーリとマルキ夫妻の原爆の図は占領中の1950年に第一部幽霊を発表し日本国内各地で展覧会を行った重要な作品ですキノコ雲や原爆道具などの廃墟ではなく幅7メートルの大画面に等身大の被爆者の群像を描いた絵画は最初に原爆被害を伝えた絵として知られています1950年は朝鮮戦争が始まった年ですアメリカとソ連の核開発競争も始まっていました核という圧倒的な脅威をもとに第二次大戦後の世界が再編されていく時期にイリとトシは隠されていた原爆の記憶を視覚的に人々に伝え現在進行中の戦争への抵抗未来の破壊の予兆として原爆の図を描いたのです核による破壊は人間の想像力をはるかに超えたものです原爆の爆発から1秒後には地上約600メートルに直径約280メートルの火の玉が出現しその温度は7000度から8000度になりました爆心地から半径 1.2 キロ圏内の路上にいた人は致命,と致命傷を負ったと言われています
第二部「火」でマルキ夫妻は一瞬にして燃え上がる人々の姿を描いています生存者のいない出来事は体験を人に伝えることができません誰も見たことのない世界をどのように描くかこの難しい問題は多くの画家を悩ませましたマルキーリ・マルキトシは日と同じ時期に出版した絵本「ピカドン」で「爆心地の話を伝える人はいません」という言葉とともに全てが焼けてしまった爆心地の風景を描いていますこの絵本は占領軍によって弾圧され原画を没収されたと伝えられていますが詳しい事実は分かっていません。四国五郎は広島の詩人の峠三吉が1951年に自費出版した原爆詩集の表紙画として影のように揺れて消えていく人々の行列を描きました鶴岡正雄は「人間帰化」という絵画で人間の姿が帰化されていく瞬間を描きました人間の感覚をはるかに超えた核爆発の破壊を抽象的に表現しようという試みです。マルキーリの母親であるマルキスマは、爆心地から 2.5 キロの地点で被爆しました。翌年の春には夫を亡くしています。その後、70歳を過ぎてから身近な生き物たちや自然を描きました。原爆の体験も描いています。広島の郊外へ逃げてきた被爆者のイメージは原爆の図にも共通します。妻は息子夫妻に体験を話し、絵のモデルを務めるなど協力していました。しかし、自分の体験を語り伝えることのできた人は当時はとても少なかったのです。多くの人は忘れたい、語りたくないという気持ちが強く、原爆の図も広島では歓迎されたわけではありませんでした。テレビ局の呼びかけで市民が描いた原爆の絵が集められるようになったのは、原爆投下から約30年が過ぎた1970年代のことです。語り伝える気持ちになるには長い時間が必要だったこと。それでも語ることのできない記憶が存在していることは忘れてはいけません1952年日本は占領から解放されました原爆の報道や写真の公開も許され雑誌「朝日グラフ」には「原爆被害の初公開」という特集も組まれ大きな反響を呼びました映画や書籍も次々と発表され、原爆を扱う絵画にも変化が見られます。高山良作は、原爆映画のスタッフとして広島を訪れたことをきっかけに、1954年に、矛盾の橋という油彩画を発表します。原爆から約10年が経ち、広島は急速に復興していきます。その象徴として、日系アメリカ人の彫刻家、イサム・ノグチがデザインした平和大橋や、丹下健三が設計した広島平和,平和記念資料館など、怪物のように描かれています。対照的に、押しつぶされるように地面に伏した裸の女性の姿もあります。平和都市、広島から取り残され、置き去りにされていく被爆者の苦しみを描いた絵です木版画の上野誠が1955年に制作したケロイド少女の原水爆防止の訴えも重要な作品です上野は1952年3月にマルキ夫妻の原爆の図巡回展を組織し自作のポスターを制作した経験がありますその後、上野は東京の駅の路上で
原水爆の禁止を訴える広島の被爆者と出会いましたそして彼の傷跡を触ったことをきっかけに大きな版画を制作しました傷ついた男性と群衆との間で戦後の時間がずれている様子が感じられます上野はそのずれを敏感に感じ取り広島や長崎をたびたび訪れ原爆をテーマにした版画の連作を数多く制作していきました1954年3月マグロ漁船第五福竜丸は太平洋の上で米軍が行った水爆実験に遭遇しました。死の灰と呼ばれた放射性硬化物を浴びて23名の乗組員が被爆しました。半年後、乗組員の一人の久保山愛吉は死亡、汚染は広範囲に及び、マーシャル諸島の住民や数百隻の日本の漁船も被爆しました。この事件は世界に衝撃を与え核がもたらす見えない脅迫を多くの人が認識しましたマルキーリとマルキトシは第五福竜丸の被爆をテーマにした原爆の図第9部「八重図」を1955年に発表しています八重図は第五福竜丸の母校の漁師町です講義の眼差しで正面を見る人が描かれています、えー、ここでは1954年に描いた第8部救出にも注目しましょうこの作品は原爆投下後の広島を描いていますが画面の左半分には原爆投下から数日後に救援に入った人たちが登場します作者のマルキーとマルキトシが自分たちを描いた唯一の原爆の図です。爆風や熱戦による肉体の被害を描いた原爆の図になぜこの時期に救援者の姿が描かれたのか。第五福竜丸の事件をきっかけに放射能汚染の影響について社会の関心が高まったことを示しているのでしょう。余白の多い画面に立ち込める霧のような白い絵の具は見えない放射性物質の危険を表しているように見えますアメリカの科学雑誌のルポルタージュ記事に挿絵を描いたことをきっかけにアメリカ在住リト,ラリトアニア人の画家のベン・シャーンはラッキードラゴンシリーズを制作しますサンゴ礁の怪物はキノコ雲の奥からドラゴンのような怪物が姿を見せています。見えない核の脅威を伝えるために、ベンシャンはドラゴンという西洋の伝統的な架空の生き物の姿を借りました。核を制御不能な怪物として示す想像力です。1954年に日本で制作された怪獣映画、ゴジラも、海底に潜んでいた古代生物が水爆実験によって目覚め、日本を襲撃するという設定です。シャーンのドラゴンと同じように、ゴジラは可視化された核の象徴です。破壊された都市のイメージは、戦争の記憶にも結びついていました。映画は大成功を収め、放射能によって突然変異した怪物という設定は、その後の SF 映画やテレビ番組に受け継がれていきます。1956年にマルキーリ・マルキトシが発表した原爆の図第10部署名は、第五福竜丸の被爆を機に広がった原水爆反対の署名運動を描いています。現在のアイキャンの活動に続く、核の大きな力に抵抗する小さな力の連帯です。原爆の図が1945年の原爆だけでなく、同時代に進行中の問題と向き合いながら展開したことがわかります。第10部が完成すると、原爆の図は世界巡回展に旅立ちました
1958年にはシドニー、メルボルン、パースなどオーストラリア各地を巡回しています。シドニー美術館ではかつての日本軍の虐殺の記憶による反日感情が高まり、展覧会は3日で中止になりました。しかし、西海岸を回るうちに大きな評判になり、最後に再びシドニーで展覧会を開催し、大盛況になりました。第五福竜丸の事件から生まれた想像力として、岡本太郎の壁画、明日の神話も重要です。1967年から2年の歳月をかけて描かれた幅30メートルの絵画の中央には、メキシコにおける生死の象徴である骸骨が描かれました。この骸骨も、核の脅威の可視化の一例でしょう。核のもたらす悲劇を超えていこうというする人間の力強いエネルギーを示す対策は、彼の代表作の一つとして、2003年にメキシコで再発見された後、現在は東京の渋谷駅に設置されています。原爆の図は1970年に初めてアメリカへ渡りました。原爆を投下した国の展覧会ではなかなか実現しませんでした。この時期に実現したのはベトナム反戦運動の影響です。過去のアメリカの戦争の加害性について関心が高まり、ニューヨークのニュースクールアートセンターを中心に8都市を巡回しました。マルキ夫妻もアメリカへ行き、観客やメディアの厳しい対応に直面しました。日本の戦争加害が指摘され、もし中国の画家が南京大虐殺のように日本に持ってきたらどうしますかと問われました。アメリカから帰国後の1971年に発表した原爆の図第13部米兵捕虜の死には、原爆投下後の広島で、被爆した米兵捕虜を報復として暴行した広島市民の姿が描かれています。日本の被害という視点で描かれてきた原爆の図に、初めて加害の視点が描かれた作品です。1972年に発表した原爆の図第14部、カラスは、焼け焦げた朝鮮人の死体にカラスが群がる様子を描いています。日本の植民地政策によって祖国を離れることを余儀なくされた朝鮮人が原爆で命を奪われるというテーマです。1970年代は唯一の被爆国という言葉に象徴される日本人の被害者意識を再興する時期でした。原爆で亡くなった人の中には日本の植民地支配によって徴用された人々をはじめ、留学生や戦争捕虜などさまざまな国の人が含まれていたのです。韓国人被爆者の擁護、援護を求める裁判も注目されていました。こうした加害の視点の発見もベトナム反戦運動の影響です。過去の戦争で日本がアジアに何をしたのか。1970年から80年代にかけて、再び日本の各地で原爆の図の展覧会が開かれますが、この時期は再び加害者にならないという視点が重要でした。その象徴としてカラスはたくさんの会場で展示されました。1950年代から60年代には、核兵器は反対だが、核のエネルギー利用は賛成という考え方が主流でした。しかし1979年には、アメリカのスリーマイル島で原爆原原発事故が発生。1986年には旧ソ連のチェルノブイリで大事故が発生します。原発は決して安全ではないことが露呈されました。妖怪漫画を描く水木しげるは、1979年10月に雑誌アサヒグラフに連載された原発作業員のリポルタージュ記事に、興味深い挿絵を描きました水木は第二次大戦で下級兵士として理不尽な目に遭い
片手を失う経験をしていますそのため原発作業員も過酷な労働に自身の体験を重ねていました原発の内部には不気味な目がいくつも描かれ妖怪が作業員に息を吹きかけています水木の表現は見えない核を架空の生き物の姿で表した点でベンシャンのサンゴ礁の怪物に似ていますスリーマイル島の原発事故も描いており天にとどろく雷と恐怖に凍りつく作業員の姿が世界の終末を予感させますチェルノブイリの原発事故では風下のなった地域がおよそ200キロにわたって高濃度の放射能汚染を受けました政府の移住の進めに従わず汚染地域に残って暮らした老人たちはサマショーロわがままな人と呼ばれました事故から6年後にベラルーシの村を訪れた貝原ひきろしは村人の暮らしや日常の文化を取材し和紙に墨と水彩絵の具で記録したチェルノブイリスケッチ「風下の村」を制作しています長い時間をかけて畑を耕し日々の営みを自然に委ねてきた人たちの暮らしを文明の最先端の科学技術の発端が踏みにじってしまった悲劇はやがて日本でも現実のものとなりました原爆投下から半世紀の歳月が描かれ21世紀になっても核に立ち向かう芸術は生まれていますただしその表現は体験者による証言から非体験者によるフィクションへと変化していきますその象徴が2008年に広島の上空で飛行機雲でピカッという文字を書き大きな騒動を起こした6人組のアーティストグループチンポムです彼らは広島の歴史の重みと現在の平和な風景とのギャップをバカバカしいような行為で明らかにしました当初それはあまりに当事者意識の欠けたいたずらだと多くの人の目に映りました新聞で報じられると被爆者団体などから抗議の声が集まりましたリーダーの後ろ龍太は謝罪会見を行い広島で予定されていた個展は中止になりました彼らの行為を批判するのは簡単ですしかし私たちは日常の隣にあった核の脅威をどれだけ現実のものと考えてきたのでしょうか2011年3月の東日本大震災と福島原発事故から1ヶ月半後東京の渋谷駅に設置されていた岡本太郎の壁が明日の神話の余白に突然福島原発事故を描いた絵が現れました岡本太郎のタッチを真似て描かれたのは原子炉建屋から広がるドクロ型の黒煙でした絵は警察に押収されましたがその後もインターネットのニュースなどで話題になりやがてチンポムが自らの作品であることを明らかにしました彼らは広島でのスキャンダルの後も被爆者たちと対話し国内外で展覧会を開催し続けていましたそして福島原発事故を岡本の明日の神話に描かれた核の歴史に追加し核を乗り越えるという岡本の思想を現代に蘇らせようと考えたのです原爆表現の原点といえる原爆の図と異なり彼らの作品は体験を伝えるものではありません観客を戸惑わせる軽薄さはこれまで核を扱ってきた芸術の道義的な正しさとは異なりますしかし現代の東京の日常と核の脅威との間の遠い距離をユーモアで縮める手法は若い世代の関心を引きつけましたシンポムの出来事は非体験の時代のリアルとは何か考えさせられました
非体験の核表現を考える際、ユニークな存在なのは、日系アメリカ人のジミー・ツトム・ミリキタニです。子供の頃に広島で過ごした彼は、1938年に渡米し、戦時中はカリフォルニアの日系アメリカ人の強制収容所に入れられていました。国籍を剥奪された彼は、戦後に職を転々とし、ニューヨークの路上で猫の絵を描いて売るようになりました。また、燃え盛る広島の原爆ドームの絵も描き、通行人が立ち止まると、原爆の非道さを訴えました。もちろん彼には被爆体験はありません。彼のトラウマは強制収容です。2001年9月11日に発生した同時多発テロの報復としてイラク戦争が発生しアメリカ国内でアラブ人への取り締まりが強まった際ミリキタニはあの時と同じだと怒りの声を上げました彼は実際に見た経験をもとにワールドトレードセンターが燃える絵を描いていますその絵と原爆ドームの絵は建物を置き換えたようによく似ています。現代の暴力や差別の問題を非体験の原爆に重ねる視点は新しいタイプの原爆表現として注目できます。今年マルキ美術館では在日朝鮮人三世の李小玉音,音楽、えー、リ・ジョンオークが原爆をテーマに新しい表現を発表しました1992年生まれのリは広島を訪れたものの加害でも被害でもなく自分の実感を伴う視点を見つけられませんでした日本で生まれ育った彼女は日本人と変わらない原爆へのトラウマを抱えていますしかも戦後の日本は政治的文化的にアメリカの影響を受けているため空から原爆を落とす側の眼差しも身近に感じますしかし一方で李は朝鮮学校の民族教育を受けており朝鮮人という一種の社会属性を生きています彼女は原爆を投下した爆撃機のコックピットの窓と原爆ドームの丸型の屋根の骨格を重ね合わせた視線を選びました細い輪郭線を描き青い空の色だけを塗った絵画は冷静にイメージを伝えますさらにリバー爆心地の空白を現代の東京の空虚な中心つまり皇居の森に重ねるという大胆な発想の都市図を描きましたもちろんこれはフィクションですゴジラをはじめ映画や漫画の影響も感じられますフィクションでしか想像しえないという若い世代の感覚のリアリティです現在の日本では戦争の記憶の風化がしばしば語られますしかし戦争がもたらした社会の矛盾は放置されたままです理のような若者さえ理不尽な差別や不安定な環境を生き続けていますその痛みは決して風化しているとは言えませんかくの理不尽な歴史は爆発による破壊や放射能汚染だけではありません実践で使用しなくても圧倒的な力を持つものが持たないものを威圧する不均衡な世界をもたらしますこれは現在のウクライナでも現実に起きている問題です芸術はリアリティを追求します私たちの日常に続いている核の脅威をテーマに選ぶことは決して不自然ではありませんその想像力が私たちに見えない脅威を知らせるのです
これからも比較芸術のニュークリアアートの歴史は続くでしょうそこに普遍的な問題が潜んでいるからこそ芸術家たちは表現せずにはいられないのです丸木美術館は原爆の像を保存するための募金活動を行っています現在世界中からのご支援もお願いしています、えー、皆様のご支援とご寄付は原爆の像将来の世代のために大切に保存するのに役立ちます個人としてまた財団や企業を通じて寄付することができます。マルキギャラリー is conducting a fundraising appeal to preserve the Hiroshima panels. We are now calling for support from all around the world. Your support and donation will help us care for and preserve the Hiroshima panels for future generations. You can donate us an individual or true a foundation, a trust, and or a company.、Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed.、Uh, that was very enlightening for our, all of us. Thank you. Now,、uh, Roberman, would you start with the、uh, questions?、Um, yes, thank you, Yasko. I've、um, just posted one for Okomura san.、Um, hey. Sorry, I'm going to read it in Japanese. Hey, chat to this. Hey, chat to this. Hey, chat to this. Hey, chat to this. So, sorry, I, should, I guess I should put the question in English. It's <laughs> 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 my mistake.、Yep. Um, so, the question、uh, to、um, Mr. Okamoto is what would be considered、uh, the most、um, famous or、uh, well recognized work in the, in the Hiroshima panel collection?、Uh, so, what would people What would be the most famous work and why is that the case? So, this is a very important thing. I think it's a very important thing. So, Yurei, which is Ghost, I believe. Yes, Ghost. Is the most famous one, perhaps. So, I think it's a very important thing. 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 Uh, so uh, because the work fo focuses on niktai, which is flesh, I believe,、yeah? human flesh、uh, or human, human body, I guess. Why is it that the image of the image is 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 the image of the image is t h a t the i t h The atomic bombing from high above from, from the sky、uh, and not, I guess, close up、uh, the effect on the humans. しかし、マルキ夫妻はあの地上において、えー、頭の上に原爆を落とされた人間の肉体を人々に伝えたいと思ったんですね。Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Maruki's wanted to transmit the, the physical effect on people.、Uh, Of the, of the atomic bombing. Hi, <laughs> there, there is another question. Yoroshi de Shoka. More to go, I must go. So I explained the second question, I guess.、Um, Mr. Okamura showed、um, quite a few mangas as well.、Mm -hmm. um, in particular, a very famous. Artist called Mizuki Shigeru,、um, who incidentally uh, also um, paints a lot of ghost stories, yokai, I believe. And、um, the question was whether Picadon could be regarded or compared to manga. And、um, there's a lot more here. There's why was it, why was it,、um, um, it wasn't permitted to be shown? 
-hmm. And what is the work that we can currently see? Uh, Lisa has a question. Uh, so, Okanama san. うん、そうですね。あの、これがあの、ピカドンという、あの、絵本で。そう、ですね。ピクチャーボック、うん。うん、ピクチャーボック、本物ですね。で、えっと、漫画と違うのは、あの、絵と言葉が別々になってるってい
、えー、とロンドンで予定しています。Oh. So there is a plan to show them in London. Uh, uh, this, this year, こ今年ですか今年です。今年の夏です。Uh, so in summer, this summer, there is plans for showing them, which is fantastic. So, but I should. Thank you. Thank you. The 1950年代 1953年にイギリスを巡回した原爆の図の記録を掘り起こす。あの歴史的なあの資料も展示されると思います。Oh, there will be there will be a display of the 1953 exhibition that they did as well, a historical.、Um, Um, some artifacts from that exhibition. Is that the、uh, same one that the、uh, 1958 world tour and、uh, Hiroshima panels came to Australia? And that is the big part of the world tour, wasn't it? Yes, I know. はい、1958年ですね。ローマンさん、レディスやチャット、ナンバーズ8、そ、so、れ must be a more question. Yes, I just, I'm just reading、uh, a wonderful question from Catherine, Catherine、mm-hmm. Zua.、Um, uh, a very difficult question. Gage to a、uh, uh, no, no、uh, code or コードとしてはどういうふうにかを考えた考えでしょうか。Have some panels in many other manga and the team of fusion. But what moves the view to act on real change? ゲイチズとしてのコード作品として、またはそのもしゲイチズはそういう役割を果たすならば、どういうふうに見る人を動かされるか。そういうちょっと難しい質問なんですけど、うん、<笑>でも<笑>、ね、まあ,あアクティビズムですよねあの行動、うん、あする行動されるその芸術の役割なんでしょうか、うんうんうん、そうですねあのうんまあ、あの私はあの芸術が原爆を取り上げる意味というのは2つあると思っています。So, um, um, he thinks that there are two reasons、uh, for, for showing this um, um,、uh, nuclear art. で、えー、と一つは、えー、同じ時代を生きている人たちの感情にこうあの刺激を与えて、えー、痛みや苦しみいろんな感情を共有する自分のた、うん、ではない体験を共有するということです。そうそれもしかすると漫画も同じかもしれません。Mm. And that's also manga is also a good example of this、um, to share the impact to new generations. でえっと、もう一つはあの、長い時間ですね、えー、ずっと未来にイメージを残すということです。The second, the second function would be to, to leave、um, uh, an image for a very long time into the future. つまり、えー、マルキ夫妻はもう死んでしまって20年が経ちます。しかし、絵は残ります。So it's been over 20, 20 years since the Marukis have died, but the pictures remain. So, the Marukis have died, but the pictures remain. So, the Marukis have died, but the pictures remain. So, the Marukis have died, but the pictures remain. 
。それが芸術の役割かなと思います。そして、えー、と私にとってはやはり「原爆の図」という作品が、えー、非常にこうあの、えー、ア,クアクティビストとして最も価値があると思っていますが。So, Okamura thinks that、uh, <laughs> the images uh, um, called Genbaku no Su、uh, have a very important activist role to play. ししもしかしたらチンプポムかもしれません。<laughs> Maybe not for our younger people, <laughs> but at least for us. <laughs> did, did that answer your question, Catherine? I hope so. <laughs> Please bring, them, um, ah, please, please bring them to San Francisco Asian Art Museum.、えっと、San Francisco no、えっと uh, Asia Bijutsu can ni ni mo kite kurasai. Kaite a r i m a s k i d ね、チャンスがあれば、あの、サンフランシスコでも、原爆の図を見ていただきたいですね。<笑> Thank you, Catherine.、Uh, beautiful. Futuristic, her- futuristic heritage.、Mm. Uh, まあ、あ遺産という役割もあります。というふうに書いてあります。はい、Barbara has just posted、uh, something. Let's have a look at it. Uh, uh, when the panels came to Australia, I understand that they have come to Australia. Ah, 1980年の Australia に時に、オーストラリアンカルチュラル、夢、インカ人ですね、デイム・メリー・ギルモア、ウィリアム・ダージっていう、um, uh, 取材者ですね、奨、uh, 学金をもらったっていう事実なんですけど、We now have、mm-hmm. nation artists creating non-nuclear. Do you know of any early Australian artists who created non-nuclear art? Oh, Australia. オーストラリア芸術家、まあ、そのそのノンヌクリアアーティストね、非芸術、非核芸術の作品、ご存知ですかあの原住民が作った。あえっ、ー、と、そうですねあの、実はそういう話も聞いていてあの、オーストラリアの後にニュージーランドにも原爆の図は行っていて、どちらの国もすごく影響を与えたという話は聞いています。でただ、私がまだ50年代の,あの世界の原爆の図展やその影響、いろんな国の人たちの、えー、ニュークリアアートについて、えー、勉強がまだ追いついていないので、これからの課題ですね。はい。Uh, exhibition traveled in 1958 to、uh, Australia and New Zealand. That was a great impact.、Um, and、uh, it was an impact on the exhibition itself as well. But、um, he said that、uh, from now on, he needs to study a little bit more about the 1958、uh, impact of the world ex- expedition. That's a, a future project.、Uh, there's a comment. From、uh, JD Mitman, Sydney, Nolan, Arthur Boyd. See,、uh, so this is an example of、um, uh, Australian Aboriginal art, I believe,、um, that we just, there's a link,、uh, Nuclear Art Rage. I'll see if I can even bring it up, maybe.、Um, So, this is、um, Black Mist Burn Country. This is an example that was just shared with us.
Can you all see that? So here's some Australian art, Albert Tucker. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Okay, maybe that's enough. Thank you. Um, Just checking if there's any other questions. Uh, there's a, a, just a, um, a comment from Vera. Thank you, Vera. Um, so this was the exhibition about art respond, responding to Maralinga nuclear tests. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Okamura-san, uh, mata Australia ni irasharu uh, yotei wa arimasu ka? Eh, to ima no tokoro, arimasen, arimasen. Zehi, mata. <laughs> あの、ね、現場このずの展覧会もしていただいてますし、あの、ぜひまた機会があったら皆さんにお会いしたいと思います。So he would very much welcome the opportunity to come again and meet us all. Thank you very much. Shall we perhaps um, try to make the sound work again? Okamura san, so no web page, moichi do yatte mimasu ka? Ah, eto, nano page desu ka? Eto, Safe Hiroshima Panels Preservation Fund. Ah, so desu ne, eto, otoka da daijoubu to moimasu. ことあの、僕の方から入ってみましょうか。私の方で接続してみます。ちょっとお待ちください。and we'll be showing a short video uh, entitled Save the Hiroshima Pen uh, Panels Preservation Fund. Hi, Miyamas. この女性よく見るとお腹が膨らんでるのがわかると思います。お腹の中に新しい命を宿しているわけですね。原爆というのは一度に十数万人の命を傷つけていくわけですけど、たった一個の命がここから生まれてくる。そういう女性の存在を描
虫食いというのが非常に今深刻な状況でこうした絵のところの白い欠損がありますよね。たくさんの人が関わっている場所なのでこれからもたくさんの人が関わっていく場所なんですよそのみんなの力がすごく大事でその人たちの小さな力がものすごいたくさん集まって歴史を作ってきてるっていうところがこの美術館の大切な部分じゃないかなと思いますね。その中心に原爆の図という作品があるんだと思います。Thank you, Okamura san. There is another question、uh, from Tomoko in the chat now. Yoroshiku o n e g a i s h i m a s So the question、uh, in English is、um, the quite complicated difference between Hankaku and Hikaku, non nuclear versus anti nuclear. Yoroshiku o n e g a i s h i m a s So, this is a very good q そう,あのそうですね、反核,あの核に反対するっていうことはあの、このように核が使われない状態であったとしても存在するということだと思いますので、で私はあの、まあ、というより、マルキ夫妻が望んでいたのは、あのこの世から核による威圧も含めて、あの攻撃とかあの強いパワーで人を支配する。あのこようなあの考え方がなくなることを願っていたので、まあ、あのそれはこれからの社会にとても重要であるとあの、世界に広まってほしいということは考えています。Uh, Hikaku,、uh, so non -nuclear, nuclearity, I guess, to, to,、um, to not use nuclear weapons as, as deterrents or、uh, to pressure other countries.、Um, so that's, that's one of the major differences between the two terms. それでは私からもあの質問があります。Yes. Yes, I have a question.、Yeah. Um, 核はもうすでに世界にあるわけですよね。ですからそれをあの核の存在を否定するということはあできないと。人類が核 
力をあの持っているわけですよね。それをあのその使い方を間違えるからあるいは意図的に間違えるからあのウクライナでも同じようなあの悲惨なことが起きうるわけですよね。あの事故ではなくてつまりそのあの核戦争それそこまで行き着いてきた今の状態をあの岡村さんはどういうふうに思われますかそれでも比較ということがあのそれはマルキーご夫妻の,あのご意見でしたよね。岡村さんもどの岡村さんはどのようにお考えでしょうか、はい、そうですねあの私自身で言いますとあのやはりあのマルキ美術館という場所にはで働きながら考えることがとても多くてうんこうまあ私はあの単にこの世から核がなくなればいいと思っているだけではないんですね。あの核じゃなくても人は死んだり傷ついたりするわけなので、えー、あらゆる命をどうあの生かしていくか、えー、傷つけずに、えー、尊重しながら生きていくかってとても難しい問題。多分あのすごく長い時間の中で人類が考え続けなければいけない問題の本質が核の中に潜んでいると思っています。なので、えー、考え続けること、えー、すぐになくなるかどうかという現実の的な問題とともに、えー、それによってであの核によって傷つく人たちのことを考え続けること暴力ですね言い換えれば暴力によって目に見えても見えなくても暴力によって傷つく人たちのことを我々がどれだけ考え続けることができるかっていう哲学的な問題をあの現実的な問題のこともう一つあのつなげながら考えていくことはとても重要で、えー、私は美術館の人間なので、えー、美術表現というのは哲学の側にとても近いと思っていますだから起きてしまうこと現実に起きてしまうことこれまでもたくさん繰り返されていますけれどもそれを表現して記録して伝えて残していくその中から常に問いをあの立ち上げていく考え続けることがとても重要だなというのは、ね、私は思いますね。すいません、ね、長い答えです。そういうふうに、ね、あの別に解決という糸口、解決ということはあ,、まあ、ありえないかもしれませんけども、それを考える、そういうあの暴力がいまだにはびこっているこれ、この先も暴力があるということを、かかり続けそれをどのようにあの、まあ、なくしていくか理解していくかそれが大きな問題でしょうねローマンさんごめんなさい長くなりましたああすいませんあのできる限りあの翻訳はチャットに入れましたけどすみませんでした、うん、<笑>あの so I've tried to <笑> I've put the essence of the wonderful discussion between Yasko and、uh, Okamura san into the chat. So please have a read.、Um, also, Stephen is saying、uh, we'll have to finish roughly on time. Yep, that's in another、uh, 50 minutes to set up the next panel.、Um, yep, so I'll hand back to you, Yasko. I think it's time to、um, close. Yes, okay. We,、uh, we are going to、uh, close, but、uh, between Okamura san and I, we're talking about would that be possible to uh, uh, deplete uh, nuclear? But it, it's 
it's not the uh, answerable questions, of course, but the way we are thinking all the time, what we can do about you know, this uh, nuclear power or some uh, injustice, you know, violence. Uh, so long as we are continue thinking and also uh, heritage of this uh, artistic power to condemn the violence, that's where we are probably uh, starting to think of how to create um, nuclear free or violence free world. So uh, thank you so much indeed. And we are now in time of 11.30, so we have to finish here. Okamura-sensei, arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Arigatou gozaimashita. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm just going to make a very preliminary uh, welcome and then um, hand over to uh, Mima Smart uh, for her welcome and introduction. My name is Paul Brown and I'm coming to you from Cadigal land in Sydney and I pay my respects to the elders past and present and emerging uh, for this land on which I live and work. And I also acknowledge the um, Pitanjara Anangu people uh, from the Maralinga area and from Yalata and Oak Valley communities, whose stories inform uh, everything we're about to talk about in this one and a half hour session. Um, welcome to uh, the people there at the Sejuna Arts Centre. Uh, if anyone's not sure where that is, it's uh, way over in South Australia. We're getting on towards the border with Western Australia, in fact. And uh, we have uh, Mima Smart, OAM, uh, sitting in the middle. Uh, Rosalind Peters on her left. Uh, Cindy from Oak Valley on Mima's right and Glenda Ken behind. And uh, Pam Dement uh, as well. Welcome to all, all of you and welcome to the audience. And Mima, can, can I pass over to you to uh, make a welcome there and uh, an introduction? Over to you, Mima. Thank you, Bob. Welcome, everybody, to our country introduction about the story of Melinda. And this is from Australia, Cindy Watson here on my right. She lives in Oakley, west of Maringa. Myself and friend in the back, Ross and Peter, next to me on the left. We are painted at, in the platform at the Pinkhead Gallery in Sydney, where four o'clock. And today, I am looking back to what has happened to a beautiful land of Maralinga. The land that was exterminated by the Adam bomb. Before the bombs, a families were still in the desert and were traveling south to a place which was called Uldia Mission. In Uldia Mission was a place that was looked after by the missionary and her family there. They were all happy. Kids were put in homes and girls and boys were in different countries. People were happy there because they have settled down from a long way which they have been moving around through the desert. They found a home. They have given their new names plus their native names by the lady named Stacy Bates. They lived there for a long time. 
After many years, the British Army sent men to India Mission to have a meeting about what, uh, what was going to happen in a few months or weeks time. After that, the white missionary had a meeting with, the, with all the white people and all, all the people were living there. That's where I came. They were told about the testing and was passed and to a message to the Anangal people. When I say Anangal people, it was the Aboriginal people that have came from the desert. The next day, the missionaries brought everybody together, sat in the circle, and was told them about what is going to happen. When the message was given to all the people, they felt angry. They all got upset. Some were hitting their head and sticks and stones. Others were putting sand all over their body. They were all crying, sadly, saying, We are, where are we going now? We are going to a place we never ever been to. This is the place where they belong, the place they came to all the emotions and they thought they were going to live forever. But all the emotions was closing up and everybody was given rations of food to take with them for their children. People were taken by truck to Kuniba Mission to put their kids in home, while others walked towards south. They were putting tracks on the sand so that others could follow them. When they didn't come, we thought maybe they have gone hunting. They went on different tracks. Maybe the wind blew their footprints away. Some were lost. A lot of families are still wandering around out there in the desert today because they never went traveling on to the south when the place was closed. They didn't know the old mission was closing. In the morning, they went out hunting. Our people were divided into four groups. Some went south to Yalata, some went to Western Australia, others to Northern Territory and across East South Australia. It was a really, really sad day for our family to leave all the mission, which, which they thought they were going to live there forever. They enjoyed living there, but was gone. Her families were lost and didn't know what place they were going to. Just like they were the people who were taken out of the desert by Moses, as it says in the Bible. Because of the poison from the bombs being tested at Maranga, it was no good at all. That poison has killed so many of their families through that atom bomb and radiation on everything. Sands, trees, animals, buildings, and other things that people used to hunt for. Their families are really upset by all this mess, and I am glad you are all here today to hear our story. Truly told, it is important that these stories are told for our next 
generation to come. And we haven't got so many old people that all passed away. Only one is left, and that's Margaret May. But she can't remember all the things now. They all, all the things that we, she knew about her life story. And she's the last one from the desert. So we are really a new generation of people that are kept from the whole cream of earth, passed on the stories that is, they have been told us. So the next generation could hear the story, and it's truly told that these things have really happened to them. And in that community, we haven't got any of those old people who've been in Hulia Mission and walked from Hulia to Yalaka to a place and our other families in APY, Western Australia, East. They probably the same thing what has happened to her mom. So we only have just a little bit of young and you know, old really starting to get to know all these old people that passed on from low time ago, who has already given to us the story. And we've got them in their mind, in their heart. And every time I talk and read about these things, it's just like looking at a movie or they're here with us, you know, as a person and all about what they usually do that is better. But the white people who thought it was a good fun, you know, they thought that the country was empty, like no people was seen there who lived with it. But it's just a happy place and they thought. Huh? We, we can do anything, we can go into the destiny there. But truly I'm saying our people were still on the desert. And they knew this place would be a mission, and that's where the people were coming to south to that place. And they were traveling in by foot and foot each day of or week. And they were still traveling to that. So they came past and they stuck in that middle of one of the families, father, mother, and a daughter and a son. And they and they seen this group, what this group here walking in the desert. They thought it was a coast because they were white men. They was only looking for their family, the brown skin family, who they were together and they traveled, you know. And they were the last people that came through to Julia. It was already terminated with the radiation and the bombs and the testing in Maryland. And then they were taken to so the came and took them and put them in Maryland and set um, them in the little cell where they have to sleep together, not separately from each other with a father and a son in one room and a mother and a daughter in another room. But they thought they, they wanted to be, be together. If they lived together and traveled around together in the bed. And that later, the next day, they have to be what's called track to yellow path that they have to bring it to see if they were, to see and recognize the people there if it was their family that they were looking for. And the soldiers took them, the manager, general manager in Merlinda village, they took their family back to Yellow Pass. And people was told in the community, there's a, some leftover people are coming to So can you recognize this your family or not? But they were going to be taken back and be shot out for a if it wasn't their family. So our families were all waiting and 
sticking around, waiting for the soldier to bring those last group of family. And when they was, when they seen the corridor and the family in that car, in that corridor, they still outside the people. They reckon, they recognize the families that were sitting. When the doors were open, the mother, the lady and the men ran to meet the family, their uncles and aunties, and they were proud. There was the last season that was having the best of the same food expected. We are putting it, we are um, sitting in the kitchen there. And it is true, you know, they made a big mess. They thought nobody was in the desert, no Aboriginal walking. So they thought it's a big empty space with a tour testing there. But it is wrong. It's a white man's problem that kill our family. That's why we don't have the whole people in their community today. Only one left. Thank you. Thank you, Mema. Palia. So, um, can everyone hear me? Um, can you hear me okay in Sedona? I just got a message to say that my internet was unstable. Can you still hear me in Sedona? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of housekeeping things for the, the people who have joined this seminar. And as we know, it's a seminar that's uh, on Zoom rather than in person, which was the original plan for this. And uh, it means things happen a little differently. Um, for questions and answers, which will happen towards the end of our time, uh, the process is that you would go to the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and write your questions into there. Uh, they'll be seen by um, the host and by the panellists and we can then respond. So by all means, start, a, start entering questions there at any time. Um, we've got a few more um, presentations as part of this seminar. Uh, before we open it out to uh, general questions. Okay, so um, what I think would be really good right now is to get a sense of uh, where you all are out there at Sejuna and to take a, a look at that uh, art centre. We, we're, we're looking behind you at um, some fantastic artworks on the, on the walls. But um, I think Pam and Graham Dement have arranged a, a way that we can do a, a little virtual tour of the Arts Centre so, um, and get a sense of the type of work that's, that's being done by uh, artists uh, from Sedona and the surrounding regions. Pam, over to you. Um, Paul, um, Nima and um, Cindy will probably talk about one of the paintings after. Hang on, I've got to get this to work. And Graham's, Graham's been daydreaming. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, there, there are some paintings in there that, that um, they want to talk about specifically. Is that what I heard? There's one that Nima's done long, long time ago. And, uh, right. Okay. Fantastic. Let's, let's do that. Um, that's yeah. fine. We're, we're having a fairly freewheeling session uh, and it'd be great to get to know the, the work that's there and to, to hear from the, the painters. I'm just waiting for Brian to get Am I switched off there as a videoist? I'm, my name's up on the screen. Yeah, there's no, no video there at the moment, Graham. Yeah. Not, there's none there yet. Um, Stephen, are you, are you there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I just like he's dropped out of the panelists. So I just put him back in. Um, it's Graham's. Yes. No, it says my video has stopped.
There you go. You're back on, Brett. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we had a glimpse of it then. Yep. Yes, we're, yep. we're away. Okay, we're back on the road. So, uh, I think Brian's going to take us round. Uh, and, 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 what's on screen? Yeah. And what about that painting that um, Memo wanted to talk about? I'll, I'll get time to come over and we could bring it over here. Memo, is that your So a lot of, a lot of the artwork here 
and the arts sector is here to support all Indigenous artists on the far west coast, and far away where Cindy lives, Oak Valley, um, Yalata, Skidesto, which are, is a homeland not far from Yalata or Sedona, and then you've got Coolaba and Sedona. So the arts sector here are set up to support all, all Indigenous artists on the far west coast. Okay. Yeah, and the, and the panic that we do is, is help the story. In, in, in where uh, people have left it, we tell a story to people and what it means to them, which they feel to themselves, and they pass it on to us. And we do the decorations and practice on carving of the wood. And the banking, and it represents the country which they live and walk about and hunt and gather food, food and food where they live in the desert. Because of the food, you know, they were bring the food to them, got up down it, and what the white man made. And that troubled the health part in their life, and it was mixed from the desert to the sea, you know, and was living on them. And years and years later, a lot of people are now living with, with um, kidney problem, liver, and lungs. And other riders and all other schools, diabetics. This is the life that they ended up with after the ten years came out of the desert on those foods and put their lips on the desert. And they come to the second part of the food that they were introduced. In the, after the mission, at the Russian center. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Pam and Graham and, and Mima. Um, great to see what's going on there. Um, the second half of this uh, seminar is going to focus mostly on the, the work that is currently in exhibition at the Tin Sheds Gallery. And this is where um, I'm going to very briefly show a, a slideshow of the works that are in the gallery. And uh, for Stephen, who's our tech person, um, I'm about to try and share my screen. So we're, we're hoping this works. Now, I'm, I'm hoping everybody can now see my screen. It's uh, got a heading, Atomic Arts Maralinga. And um, the, the image there is of a, <clears throat> a very large banner. It's about almost three metres long and one metre high that was uh, produced for a musical performance back in 2016. And um, while that particular banner is, is not in the uh, tin sheds at present, um, in the art and activism in the nuclear age section of this exhibition, uh, there are some works that complement the uh, drawings and paintings and other artifacts uh, from uh, Japanese artists. And, and here they are. And you'll, you'll remember this, this large painting. Um, if anyone saw the Black Mist Burnt Country exhibition which was touring around Australia 
uh, a few years ago. Um, this large painting on the left uh, was produced for that exhibition. Um, the artists who did it, are, some of them are sitting there in front of you, um, but it was a, a group painting uh, done by approximately 16 or 17 people. Um, at the same time that that painting was being produced, there were other smaller paintings that were being done by the group. And that, that group of paintings in collection is part of the current Tin Sheds exhibition. There are some other works on the right hand side there. Jesse Boylan's photograph of Yami Lester. And uh, another work by Charia Stanley that was also in Black Mist Burn Country. So as a group, the uh, the smaller paintings uh, depict some of the stories that um, we've been hearing. And I'll just show you them <clears throat> briefly as a slideshow. That's Glenda's painting. Glenda is sitting uh, in the back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the slideshow. We can go back to look at them if you want, but um, I'll just stop sharing for a moment. And uh, I wanted to I wanted to ask um, the the artists about those paintings. Um, we we heard your uh, song that you were singing while they. Uh, <laughs> maybe do, could you tell us why you were singing and what that song was? It was all there, like green clouds and waters and trees and plants, branches, green branches on, on the trees and birds were all singing in the trees and People were hunting and living together, you know, grew up, everything was nice. And then later in the couple of years later, after the testing, 
that felt like it's a dead body, yeah? All the trees of the branches of the trees were all born, cried up, and the green grasses all turned into black and yellow or whatever, cried up, and the water in the on the rock or in the lake were all cried up and left like muddy and sticky. And the birds all gone, you know, not, not much food there, or what they always do on. Nothing there left, dead bones and skeletons of the animals and both people's body, all gone. And that's what is left out of those testers. And that was the song that we sang every uh, every people was living every in the place where the in the desert and then after the death it was it all killed and that they ate in some trees they were and then you go you feel sick you know from all the radiation to poison. It, Mina, is is that why I've, I've always I've always been curious. Why uh, is your own painting called "Life Lifted into the Sky"? That that shows about the ground that was really good enough when they had done the testing. It lifted their like it lifted all of those people who lived on that and walked on that land has been lifted up to the sky. Mm. And they are no longer here today. And um, because of that radiation that feeds you them from the sky. And, and uh, you want. I can I can see that uh, the the paintings have several things uh, that are the same in each painting, the, the image of the bomb, uh, but also the image of trucks and the railway. Um, can, um, can the artists tell us about those particular motifs, those ideas in, in those paintings? Oh, and the roads and truck company, over there, another, another. You will never get a look at the painting. You know, like people want to do more generally in those. After the two, one of the person, after that thing closed, people, not rather like liberated, you know, and all their feet they have to move. And the truck went and caught them all. And, Took, took the map from Moody and because they're gonna put that thing, you know, bomb. But said people are not going to stay around there, only are there to me. No one left, no one left to stay there, you know. They always go there, but all across that railway and now find a better place to live. So they went and they saw this beautiful country, you know. That's what they were promised to say that they were like they were from that to India. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so. People were yeah. living right there first and then hunting and people from mm -hmm. over there. Help families, parents, mm -hmm. father and mother were from school. Mm -hmm. It was epic at that time. And now that British Army that to the smoke, they said they no longer stay there, you know, they have to leave the country. But today was fine, not the power, you know, they wanted to leave there. They said they had a home there, all the people from the school have to, have to, you know, from school there. And then all people were shaking their head and all, they said, oh, we're going to stay there. Uh, they said, forced to like leave the country. Yeah. They have to cross the railway, pick up one and then took them, you know, like two loads of two loads of it. Not let them live one day. And they can destroy right. a country. Some of them are still walking. Some of them are still walking. 
Thank you. I'm I'm just wondering the group of painters who worked on this. Um, what was the what were the age ranges? Were, were there young painters working in these yeah. paintings as well? Yes, they were young. From the and my granddaughter was there, and we just came over there. From what I tell, from say like thirty to where that time was from fifteen to fifteen, fifteen, fifteen. That that the age group that started there, I think, yeah. And my nana in 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 the training group is telling the class that went to overseas with you for Ellie and Andrea and Russell and took that um fish class with Stephen and um um Jeremy boys and that. Okay, so um, I'll just uh, interrupt with a message for everybody about questions. Um, I've been told uh, by Stephen that um, it's not possible actually to uh, do what I was suggesting and that is to put questions into the Q&A section. So, I think I'm right in saying this. Stephen will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we're going we're going to take the questions through the chat. So if you if you do have a question, please type it into the chat, and uh, I will try to keep my eye on that and um, bring the questions forward. Um, so while you're doing that. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to to ask Pam. Um, Pam, you've you've seen a, uh, the range of artworks coming through the Art Centre that come from Yalata. They come from the APY lands uh, further north, um, and and many of them do address the issues of the atomic bomb. Um, what's your uh, take on the range of artworks that deal with the bomb coming coming from the South Australian communities? Well, probably over the years that I've been at the Art Centre and, and been involved with the Maralinga and the Atomic Bomb and the Oak Valley people in Galata and Skidesco, Kuda and Sojourner, is, um, I suppose, you know, it, it retains the story for the younger people, but there's a lot of different mediums too. There's um, Eve Warren Paul, who did um, some big clay, clay bombs. That's been, um, it, it, it was a bit simple about your one people, um, Paul at Tandania. I think it was in Black Mist Burnt Country and recently in another exhibition that went to Melbourne. So a lot, of, a lot of the artists paint. Um, so always the picking marrow when they're in that sort of come out about in the years because um, the British put a lot of money into the cleanup and people went there and in the 70s apparently and and a lot of things were you know given out 
that you could take home and stuff like that. So it was all radio, pretty well radioactive in those times. So like Nima was saying, you know, that it, it dispersed people off their country and, and it's important for the older people to hand this down from generation to generation, whether they do it in video, whether they do it in painting. So I've been involved with the painting that you were showing up on the wall there for. Um, yeah, it's just a really sad time in our, our history and I don't think people should um, forget, you know, this actually happened out here without permission from Parliament or anything, you know, they were told by Robert Menzies at that time to come in, you know, you can use this country out here. There, there's no one living out there, but like Linda said, you know, the real story. And, and to me, as a, a white fellow travelling from their country, it be like looking for an egg in a haystack to find people out there. Like, people have to know so well with their environment. You know, if they didn't want to be down, they were down. And, and it was such a fast area. So, it's, you know, I feel really sad for people who were dispersed off their land. And, and it's really good to drive that thing for people to put it down in a, in a visual part of the video, whether it's you know, a run out or whether it's painting. So, Cindy has also done some really beautiful paintings at um, Oak Valley that she depicts um, the Marilena bomb. So, so it's really ingrained in people. And I think it's important for not only, you know, Unruh to retain this kind of history, it's also important for white people too to see what, you know, what was actually done to the country out there. And there's some places out there now that, you know, people can't go out of Marilena. Um, Recently, they've opened up as a, a, a tourist thing, but there's only small parts that you can go to. But to me, you know, for the people, they they got to keep telling their story and, and you know, I've you know, just been a small part of it, just helping them along that path and from doing the vision part of producing beautiful paintings and, and telling their story. And it's so important. And, and, you know, over the years, the last... 20 years that I've been involved with it, you, you can see that growing and people being more aware. And, and thanks to people like Bill Paul and David Hitman, you can come out here and let people tell their stories, let the other group tell their stories. And that's the way, but not, I think it should be done because it's an important part of our history around here. Thanks, Pam. And uh, there are two questions so far in the chat. And uh, just a reminder, if you've got a question, it, it should go uh, into the chat, not the Q&A section. Um, uh, and now a third question. Um, Roman has, has just asked, what, what topics are people painting today? And uh, I know that there's a development uh, at Yalata where the roadhouse is, is opening up and providing an outlet for paintings and also punu, the, the uh, carvings. Um, but what are, what are people using as the, the topics for their paintings? Um, The bomb is one topic, but are there other topics that are um, becoming important? Seven sisters, cultural. Yeah, seven sisters. <laughs> well, we talk about, we complain about the seven sisters. Uh -huh. and, <clears throat> and also do the um, landscape of the land, mm -hmm. doing hard uh, bullet for the brother. They are still doing that their account. When the brother is open because of this COVID lockdown and all that, the people are not coming out to do so, but there are people some, some of people are still coming out to do, do, the, do the work on the road there. Two of them. But people are still making things, doing branding and telling stories on the paints, what they know 
from the mind or for the from the parents so all people who told the story in in their, their life and dreaming and they keep it and they do it on the hand they do the story and they get permission from them you can talk to them tell the people that my story when I'm born, it is important that you carry it on to the next two generations to have that story going. So they feel that spiritual of them are still around and giving them into their mind to tell you. you can, I, we always feel that. It's not forgotten, you know. So I want to be talking about their story. And their lifestyle, and that's why we have to paint it, do the painting and art on the sheet. So when they people look at it, come to the, the person that done it, and you, people ask what what the story is about, what is painting is about, and the artist can tell you the story. Yeah. My parents, my friends, parents' story, and then you. And hunt and walk on the rocks. In the rocks, that they know the stories, and they know the rocks when they're traveling. Where's this the next stop? You know, like you're traveling in the desert. Oh, this is where we're camping. We got a little bit of time where they have to stop. And I don't know by looking at the sun. And like when the sun is out there, now it's going to be afternoon. So we could hurry up and find a place where we're going to camp, where they've got lots of firewood, you know? Mm -hmm. and, you, and then you put it in your painting and tell them that this is the place where they last day and they travel on from rock off to rock off, you know? And they carry their fire stick. From camp to camp, the same fire stick have to lit, lit up. And if when it gets short, they have to burn a big fire and can carry the lot, one lot, which can burn it to a next camp to make the fire. Because in that time, you don't have to make this all lighter. <laughs> you know? Ooh. Nowadays, they got to make this all lighter. Mm -hmm. They know where to camp and cook and. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> and put a tent up for their people to get tents in that in that time. Yeah, travel. It's it's two different ways from from what our parents used to do. And now what we're doing is the present season that has come up. People yeah. got money to buy car. People got lighter money to buy lighters when they're traveling no. <laughs> and chance to put them on and blankets and mattress which have people didn't you know you just think that have people oh, what, in the old days what they had but there's nothing might, that might be um called um Rosalind, you can say what you mainly paint, and maybe what you paint, and what we want to a story in this paint. Now, here's that, and what have you You'll get a story, and what kind of paint is it? What kind of paint is it? Just say, what kind of paint is it? I paint, like, people want that. That story, same story, what he was saying, seven sisters, all the people telling us that story, seven sisters, and we know in the end. The story that we paint. We paint the story, we call them in the head. All people they take us out, they talk, they tell us all the way, and then we talk. So we know in the head, we keep it in the head. We can talk to anybody, any men, so boys like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just our, just our story. A supreme kind of story. Yeah. And Glenda, what about your work? Uh, 
It's just a little bit quiet for us to hear some of that. Yeah. Can I can I just ask you about the materials that you use for painting? Are all are all your paintings um, on canvas? Yeah. So they're all always on canvas and always using um, uh, acrylic paint. The is, is that right? And um, I know that at Oak Valley there is an art room, and at Yalata. The women's centre is the the space where people paint. Um, is that the case? And and also, are, are some of the young people in the community going to those places to uh, get the paints, get the canvases, and and do work? Yeah. Sure. Um, but um, we just have a meeting a couple of. Once ago, look at it. Um, the woman set up on the clothes, and that place set up on the use of the lungs and back. And then if we're going to move on to set her in the back on top of the hill there. And that's going to be the, it's going to be a big place where there's going to be hard center. It's going to be a called a hard center. If we're gonna have all the anybody can come in there to do to do uh, like the men men can do paintings, they can stories, and they can sit in outside and make artifacts and do um, dancing or making cooking candy bales when they want to make the garden. I'm talking about the people that's always making happen. They're gonna sit up outside. On the other side, inside, they're doing the hard. You know, you've got two different lots of things mm -hmm. happening on canvases and people mm -hmm. are making um, artifacts by getting my, um, my wood and making two mains and other things. And then and people can do anything there, like cook. Do some cooking with maybe dinner for themselves. Well, I just do the art, art, two tables from this side and have it in them feeling together. It's going to be big space, you know, more space than the one we've got now to help the woman stand up. It's going to be easy. Um, we have a we have another question from Alan Marrett. He's asking about uh the, the Maralinga lands themselves um, and how that country is now. Has it recovered? Is there any chance of people going back to occupy that land? I'm going to tell you now where the Maralinga land is today. Oh, where are they? Because 
because of this oh. Cindy, Cindy saying that they're not using that um, tourist not going up there anymore now oh, yeah? because oh. of the cold. Oh. And uh, oh, yeah. we got the Oakwelly Rangers now that they travel back and forth from Oakwelly to Maringa. Cindy, you're checking on things. Cindy is one of the Rangers that got found. So what? Cindy, Cindy, what I'm is very strong there, but it could be related to there's a back road from Kupiti to Lakerton on, on the back track. They have stopped that net those cows because they mm -hmm. don't want people to have them too. So the range is from up where it goes down. We are going to go check up, there, you know, check up on the track. When the crash track travel there, they pass the message on to Cindy there. And right is there, and they check up on that side. They got saved from the Now, Cindy there, and I'm going to work together. Mary. I'm going to call it. I They do surveys around of Mary. Around Merlinga to check up, checking on um, the things up there, and any strange animals coming in, you know. They do many cow um, surveys, and what that standing in, um, the little animals, oh, um, the little animals, and you want to check up some time yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and camel, camel, oh, this is Did you say camels? Camel, camel, that's a lot of camels. A lot of camels. Yeah. Trees are eating off food from the trees. So. So I get the impression there are rangers and scientists, uh, sometimes tourists that that go there. And part of Alan's question is about whether Maralinga country, where the bombs were tested and nearby, um, is all that activity, especially the tourist activity, is that somehow supporting the communities these days? Because um, because of the tourists, tourists always stay there when they have time. They bring up to marry the officer. Yep. Yeah. If, if it's okay to um, to the tourists around marry the at the park, the picnic park, they get information and can look from here. And if if, if the rangers are help, they bring up to okay. And they get permission to it. But I believe that a couple of years ago it was okay when they used to have buses and take the tourists out there to where they're testing them, love testing, but they let them bump. And they look down from the top of the thing with every safety suit. They have a sign cut there, they have to go by. Whether you say for you to walk around there and you know, pick up things, you could have special things on your body and foot and head and wheel and wheel and your hands. But you, before, in the past, I, 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 we, we were living there at Maringa when the buildings were taken out, people were fine to ready to come and take buildings. And one time, everyone was tested. Wanted to go to the testing area, go see. So, all those people who were living there wanted to go and help went to and look at the testing. We went out there 
I went and said, for the first of my came from handling missions on the train and now the fact that all the or something we knew that I was in the Indian mission. And at the railway station, I got my ride, so they went and picked me up and talked to get to Maringa. And I, when I heard that Maringa, oh, no, I don't want to go to Maringa, there's a bomb place, there's, there's a poison place. And I, they said, no, this is not only the place we have to stay till we get another lift trip to Yanaka. You know, so I stayed with my sister in law, that was Evelyn Edwards, and worked there to done some cleaning and catering for the men to work in their own country. So, this part there where we had to go and see the place where they're bombing, we had no safety things, no shoes, nothing to cover our face. If the wind was coming from that way, but three other people were walking out with no shoes. I sat in the car and looked at the closed window on top of the hill. They came down at the pit. It's, it's a big pit, a lot of dry wood, a lot of dry trees, gray, gray as can be. Mm. Long. When you when you go to Maralinga, there's a sign that you see everywhere that says Gorawia. Can you tell us what that means and whether you think that's good? It was cooked at wheel wheel. What was that? The sign says, um, Koka Palia Gora Wea. Koka Baya, Koka Baya Gora. Taking Gora Wea, 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 Still don't have mm, but just because I'll talk to one of the um yeah, from, from, um, from Canberra and from Canberra who came and said yeah. at that yeah. 400 section was giving back to the people in that couple of years ago. And he said it was one man that I know for a long time, and I go taste him all the time, and I seen that and he said. We we'll pay people who live in the village and work in the village. Whatever that will be, that will happen to them in the years to come, we've got big money to pay them. And I said, what is that we're telling us to? I said, we're going to people who work in Maryland or village, and when they die, we're going to pay them. We've got to pay them. They want money before they die. I, I always refuse it, and he, he looked down and said, Oh, that woman always don't like me. And I said to him, Because a lot of our people didn't have safety things. Your people had all the safety things on their bodies and faces, but our people didn't have the place where we're standing today. I was catering in this cat here. And their people was working and burying a bomb in there. And they didn't have safety things on them, masks or whatever, a uniform on that, until your people had a lot of things. They knew a danger that mm. things were. And they, they wasn't told, actually wasn't told in that time when they were working to them with them. And I was really wild when I said that was I feel happy. I didn't want to touch anything, but only only the end of who is what we say to me. We have another question here that is about um, what is going on in the world in uh, nuclear arms, the threat of nuclear war, uh, disasters uh, in Japan. Um, I know that there has been a connection between Yalata artists and uh, Japanese communities in the past. 
Um, a sculpture went from Yala to, to Nagasaki Peace Park, for example. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm wondering what the what you uh, and the the painters and the community in general um, think when you when you see the stories about uh, the threat of nuclear war. And this this is the question coming from Roman Rosenbaum. What do you think when you read the news about nuclear disasters, the threat of nuclear war? Well, I mean, yeah, when we war, it's, it's, it's scary, you know? It's really scary about that there. And we think back a long time ago, you know, when they're doing testing and all the it's happening in uh, Russia and things coming towards. It's really scary. And sad to see them hit people dying, anything to do you know, with all these bombings and um, soldiers and all lining up with all this stuff. It brings back memories that time when people get to know about all these things, that what's going to happen in that place where they've done the bombing. They didn't know about it. When they seeing things and hearing things now, they're a bit scared inside. You know, I don't know what they really frightened. They don't know, they didn't know about all these things happening in the past. And they say it's really sad and they're crying inside. And it's, it's, it's really hurtful for them to watch on TV. The young get people there. Yeah. So sad. It's not in Russia. And Russia's threatening the world, you know. It's, it's so sad mm -hmm. people are, innocent people are dying. We beg to live in. Happy life together, you know. And as they're gonna, how long they're gonna be gone? We live in a world of disaster, not a happy life, you know. Trying to live a happy life, but only through God. God is the helper. God is the answer to our life. Good through prayers and things, you know. We must believe in God. And he's, he's always he's looking down on the world today, you know, every day. And he's trying. When he, I see a lot of photos on Facebook, what they see up that way. You know, I, I will see if they see trumpets, they hear trumpets, angels singing, and people looking up to the sky. Because a lot of bad things are happening on the world. Mm -hmm. And it's opening their minds and eyes and ears to think and see mm -hmm. what is happening, what this thing is. Mm -hmm. It's caught up there looking and crying. Other people I see on Facebook, they see God on the Facebook full of tears. That there is it's said about things happening on the world. This world today, you know, and other countries are living a happy life, like home care, singing songs every night, every fellowship, praying for people, visiting people who are dying in hospital. You know, they are very so there and they're praying and they get through, fall down to the bridge. And that's how the world could be, how can we happen? To stop this disaster. Thanks. Thanks, Mima. And uh, there's a there's another question here from Liz. Uh, I, actually, it's a question from Judith via Liz and Roman. Uh, I can see that some people have been able to put questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, th this may actually be our last question, but if you do have one, uh, please go ahead now to put it in the chat. Um, so the, the question is bringing us back to the pictures themselves um, and, and what will be the future for 
for these particular paintings, the paintings of the, of the bomb, the paintings of the experience of Aldea. Um, where will they go next? Like if we send them back to Sojourner, what would happen to them? Um, or what would you hope would happen to them next? Yeah, I, I, that, that's the planning that we've done from the heart, you know, from the people that have stolen. It's important just to carry it on. What? Mm. That the world knows this is the thing that's been happening to our people in South Australia, and others don't know about it. Because mm. yesterday I had one. Um, one person locally had told me within a um, documentary about you talking about Marinda at the secondary area school where the kids are. And they they seen it and they said, hey, there's an amigo talking about Marinda, bomb, you know? And, and the lady that was talking to me, she never, never heard a story in her life. And she talked about that her um, grandparents were part of it. And they're dying of cancer now today. And then in the 80s and 90s, and I don't know that lady, but she told me she seen it at the you know, area school, and they were surprised, you know. I think it's time to see what we do to carry on. So there's a lot of people out there are missing out on things, what has happened to our country. Yeah. Okay. So it, it, so it can be educated properly from them, from this painting and the story, to pass it on to their yeah. children and what their grandparents have been, you know, they've been known that where they're from. And this is the really a thing, really good thing for that their hearts have to be on every every where to be seen and talk about. So so to me for what Nimmer was saying here, yeah, you know, I totally agree, you know, it needs to continue and make it worldwide, you know, so people are aware of what actually happened to the only people here. Also, what you know happening in Japan. Yeah. I mean, when I used to be manager here, we used to get a lot of tourists come through overseas, tourists, and a lot of English people. And I used to tell them the story about Marilinda, and they had they had no idea that something ever happened there here in the fifties, sixties. So, you know, what like you were saying, the more exposure you can get for their artwork worldwide, not much more. You know, people become aware of these happenings. And, um, we, we have uh, another question um, a, from, from Roman. Roman asks, Roman's asking um, a, when he comes across Australia and goes through Sedona, he he's going to go to the um, the art centre, but um, but also try to. To, to meet with some of the artists. Um, I, I think that's possible. Uh, you could go from Sejuna to Yalata in two hours in a vehicle. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> um, so I don't think there are other questions there. And I've, what I think we might do, because we've only got five minutes left, um, how would it be if I uh, do a final thank you to everyone? And then I might just put the slideshow on again and, and go through it uh, because I, I know there are some people in the participants list who are not going to be able to get to Sydney to see it live. So, um, and while the slideshow is going through, um, if you if you have any more uh, comments, any of the panelists, um, please go ahead. Uh, Roman, what was your suggestion? Um, no, that's that's thank you, Paul. Okay, so um, 
I'll get the slideshow up, but while I'm doing that, I, I just want to um, thank everybody who's been involved in this whole symposium and exhibition. It has been um, an event that has been planned for at least three years. And there are two people here, Liz and Roman, um, uh, on the screen. And I can see that Yasuko Claremont uh, we can't see her uh, video, but she's there. Um, they have been uh, driving this project for three years and uh, there's Yasuko now. Hello, Yasuko. Um, it, it has been through one of the most difficult preparation periods I've ever seen uh, because of COVID. And... Um, <laughs> There have been postponements. There have been dramatic changes in the way that this whole program has unfolded. Um, and even for today's symposium, up until about four weeks ago, we still had the hope that it could be a live event with people coming to Sydney. Yeah. But the COVID situation, as we know, has um, been a big problem. Yeah. Uh, I didn't say this at the start, but I want to acknowledge another painter, and that's Missy Windless, who was to have joined us today, but couldn't because of COVID. Um, so things have been changing right up to the last minute um, in this very difficult time. And I just want to thank everybody who's, who's been able and willing to host this particular part of the program. To, to bring these works and these artists um, to you. Um, can, I just, can I just thank you, Paul, because without you and without the Yalata artists, a very important part of the exhibition would never have been shown. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, Lily Zhang is, is on there and uh, we had Stephen before um, helping uh, and the gallery staff. Um, uh, I'm not sure if any of them are, are here today. Um, Yakov, um, Kate, isn't it? Um, who put the exhibition together so wonderfully. And there were some other people who worked on catalogs and programs and so on. Thanks, thanks to all of them. And then finally, a, a big, big thank you today to uh, those of you in Sejuna who set up this Zoom link, um, uh, Pam and Graham Dement on the technical side, um, Mema, Roslyn, Glenda and Cindy who came to talk with us uh, and tell us those wonderful stories and explain the paintings. So thank you very much everybody who's been involved. And uh, I know some of you are driving back to Yalata uh, today or tomorrow, um, safe travel. Um, unless anyone's got anything else to say, I'll do what I said. I'll put the slideshow back on. Yeah, I would say something more. Yes, and, Emma. And we talked about that too a couple of years ago. And I would like to ask you to bring those kids back to the you know, so our people can see it. Uh, sorry, what? But that thing near where we went into the went into the street thing and listened to all the photos and stories about the marriage, I think. Yes. I talked to you about uh, I was waiting to see that road to come back to Sikuna so the local fear when Sikuna and Yellow began to see. Yes, let's let's try and do that again. Uh, uh, for those who um wouldn't have seen this. Um, what Mimo is asking about is another type of artwork that, that has come out of Yalata, and that is a um, digital projection for screening on a large oh, circular true. arena. Mm -hmm. um, and it was produced for a major <clears throat> exhibition at Tandanya National Aboriginal Cultural Institute back in yeah. 2016. But um, we have never been able to um, tour it to other parts of uh, South Australia. 
and um, we we keep the hope alive that we'll be able to do that. And um, most recently, there's been a suggestion that um, through the Sejuna, through Sejuna's annual festival, um, we might be able to put that on in Sejuna. That will be really important because that's going to be for everybody, you know. And yeah. a lot of people heard about this thing when we were in picnic at time for the opening. Mm. A lot of us went back and it was really hurtful when we were first working there. And, and the people who came from here because of the parents that was included in there. Yeah. And you know, they have a lot of questions and the company is gone now. Yeah? We need to bring it back to the local school. Yeah? So they, they were really happy to, they really wanted to see this and hear that. And we've done that and brought it together for the world to see and other people from out of Australia to see what has done, you know, what they've done to a country. Um, That's to come back on that uh, moist fest this yeah. year or next year. Yeah. Next year, every it'll be really good by organising people putting together to, you know. To yes, we must keep we must keep trying to do that. Um, I so I think so. I children that see, you know what it is, what this is about. Yeah, it was really touchy. Eh? Mm, that's all I wish for. Um, it says unlikely journal for creative arts issue five. Um, um, if anyone wants to see more about the, uh, the, the work coming out of Yalata, um, you can Google that and go to that link. And um, the the paintings project is documented there. The sculpture project that went to Nagasaki is documented there. And you can find um, documentation oh, about yeah. the digital projections that Mima is talking about. And anyone can contact me personally if you, if you want to be able to see that film, at least in the um, 2D version. Okay, uh, well, look, we've reached one fifteen, and it's it's important because of the next session that we conclude this one. Um, that that was very useful final discussion, but it means uh, I, I don't think I will put the slideshow on again if well, that's okay. Because we need to move on. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations, <laughs> everybody. We will come for the next, yeah, next one, next time. We'll go, but don't hit us. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah. mm. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Hola. Hola. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Dear attendees, Thank you. we will have a, a short lunch break. And next panel will start at 2 p.m. Yeah. And disarmament. And we also have with us today, Jen Rowan, during her studies in law and communications at UTS, Sydney, Jen became involved in campaigns to stop uranium mining and the establishment of radioactive waste dumps. Her experience working as a radio producer and outreach coordinator for Australians for War Powers Reform gave her significant experience in community organising media writing, design and fundraising. She's the Australian director of ICANN and director of Quit Nukes, a campaign to persuade Australian financial institutions to exclude nuclear weapons producing companies. As ICANN director, she leads the campaign and volunteers working to lo lobby Canberra to sign and ratify the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And she was a recipient in 2021 of a Peace Women Award from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And the final speaker we have today, Tillman Ruff, Honorary Senior Fellow in the School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne, 
co-founder, founding international and Australian chair of ICANN and serves on the committee of ICANN Australia. I can't possibly summarize his career long activity in the cause of peace and global health, but to list a few organizations, co-president of the international positions for the prevention of nuclear war, past national president of the Medical Association for the Prevention of War Australia, advisor to the International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation, and delegate representative to, um, think, to conferences such as the Landmark Intergovernmental Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons. In 2017, he led the, inter the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War delegation in New York through the negotiation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. In 2012, he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia for service to the promotion of peace and to public health. And in 2019, officer of the Order of Australia for distinguished service to the global community as an advocate for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament and to medicine. So what we thought we would do today is that we've come up with a number of questions um, around which we can structure the, uh, the session with in the middle of a slideshow and also some videos. We do have a video to show you uh, right at the beginning, which um, just give you some background and which I will now try to share with you. Just checking, can you see that? I now declare the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons open for signature. Article one of the treaty sets, sets forth the, the prohibition. That really sets the, the, the normative standard. It sets down the basis for the stigmatization of nuclear weapons. When it comes to the prohibition of nuclear weapons, those are airtight. You cannot do anything with nuclear weapons anymore under this treaty. This treaty is the first uh, nuclear weapons instrument to recognize the disproportionate impact that nuclear weapons have on indigenous people, on women. It encourages the participation of women and gender diversity in discussions and negotiations around nuclear weapons. We haven't had that before. Um, we haven't had a nuclear weapons instrument that really addresses the need for victim assistance or environmental remediation. The treaty has what are called positive obligations, which uh, mobilize and require support for uh, the victims and survivors of nuclear weapon use and testing, and also uh, remediation uh, of, the, of the contaminated environments. To me, um, I'm just going to go now to wow, uh, Tillman Ruff. Thank you for coming out this morning to see uh, uh, Professor Jason Castillo from Texas A&M. Hello, uh, Liz. Uh, thanks very much for the welcome. Yes. Sorry, this video started playing again. <laughs> so. Um, Tillman, what led you to, what precipitated the founding of ICANN? Well, there was a couple of things that, that happened in 2005, and that's really when the seed was, was planted. Um, there were two sort of countervailing emotions, I guess. Um, 
at the time. One was frustration, sort of verging on despair, that uh, particularly after the five yearly review conference of the Non Proliferation Treaty, so the almost all the world states that are members of the Non Proliferation Treaty, which is an important nuclear treaty that where the states that had nuclear weapons when the treaty was established in 1970 commit to get rid of them in exchange for those who don't have them not acquiring them with some sweetness for them. And, um, you know, 50 years later, almost, you know, there's no sign of disarmament progressing. So the review conference happens every five years. Uh, they meet diplomats, hundreds of diplomats meet for a month. And in 2005, they agreed nothing, absolutely nothing. So one would think that that would be a serious wake up call that you know, business as usual is not going well and we need a new approach and some new energy and commitment um, to really deliver on this um, long unfulfilled promise. So a few months later, September, the World Summit happened. It was to that time, the largest meeting of heads of state that had ever been held. Um, and again, it agreed not a single line on nuclear disarmament, in fact, on any disarmament issue. So there was, I think, a real sense of um, frustration and around people working for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, clearly what we were doing was not working. Um, and at the same time, there was the extraordinary inspiration that was provided by the success in fairly short order over less than a decade of the international campaign to ban landmines that working initially with the government of Canada and then a few of the other um, you know leading humanitarian governments in the world not the biggest and most powerful but the Norways of the Austrias of the world um, who worked together to go, to deliver that treaty that banned landmines despite crucially despite the opposition of the major users and producers of those weapons in the most powerful states the US Russia and China that never joined those negotiations and haven't joined the resultant treaty, even though they've been influenced by it. So one of our sort of wise elders, um, Datu Dr. Ron McCoy, a Malaysian obstetrician um, who'd been the longest serving co-president of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, wrote a really um, powerful, quite short email message to a bunch of us and um, and essentially said, we need a new campaign and it should be called the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Um, and a number of us in Australia were really struck by the power and the, um, it was the right idea at the right time and thought, well, you know, we can help with that as much as anybody. So, it was really that, that that was really the genesis and a group of us in the Medical Association for Prevention of War in Australia, which is the Australian affiliate of the International Federation of which I have the, the really humbling honour to be a co-president, IPPNW, um, took it on to host and build and nurture um, that campaign really as a, as a gift uh, to the to the world as an outreach vehicle, hoping that uh, that others would see the utility of, of the idea. Um, we managed to get some funding from some visionary uh, philanthropists in, in Melbourne, um, Eve Cantor and, and Mark Wooden and their, the wider Cantor family. And essentially with a relatively small group of committed people with a, with a passion and a plan, who crucially could also get on and work together and, and, and vaguely trust each other. <laughs> you know, that was, um, that was, that's how things start from little things, big things grow. So essentially that was its genesis back in um, 2005. We sort of developed it in 2006 and then formally launched it first in Melbourne at Parliament House and then at, um, in Vienna uh, a couple of months later in 2007. And how many, is there a, a whole international network now, isn't there? Do you know roughly how many um, brands? Yeah, so, so the idea was to, there are a couple of, of sort of basic principles that we decided fairly early, early on that I think 
served us well and have really stood the test of time. So we wanted to be respectful of the many organisations that had been working long and hard uh, in this field of trying to get rid of the world's worst weapons, um, but with fairly disparate approaches, but wanted to not replace them with a new uh, representative membership-based organisation, but, but have a, a nimble and lean campaign that would link them together, add value, uh, provide a coordinating vehicle that would help people sing from the same hymn sheet uh, on United Cause around a very simple, compelling, hopefully, goal of a treaty process to ban and provide for the elimination of the world's worst weapons of mass destruction. And to do that, not by emphasizing the politics and the security arguments, um, but really bring it back to what these weapons actually do. Uh, they're unacceptable consequences um, if used in any, in any context for any purpose. So I think that was, that was really wise. I think we made a really serious effort to, to launch a global campaign from the beginning. It just happened to be launched in Australia um, to make it as simple and non-onerous as possible for organisations to join. So all you had to do with, was agree with the goal, be willing to work non-violently, associate yourself with it, and there was no cost involved and no particular you know, formal obligations, um, just an invitation really to, to, to work together. Um, we deliberately tried to work with, with, um, with young people and include, um, uh, include young people who, you know, most of the pundits were saying, you know, they don't get nuclear weapons issues and they all grew up post the Cold War and they don't understand that these things haven't gone away. Um, <laughs> and we wanted to make it global. Um, and we really wanted to try and, and balance um, the horror that you need to understand uh, about nuclear weapons, that this is urgent and serious, um, but also the hope that this is a solvable problem. There's only nine countries that have them. It doesn't require you know, restructuring the whole global economy and fundamentally changing many parts of industrial society like addressing climate change does. It should be pretty simple. It can be done. We're you know, well on the way to eliminating other indiscriminate and inhumane weapons on the basis of treaties that provide one standard for all, all nations. So we know how to do this um, and balance that, leaving that with humour and, and always with you know, fundamental humanity. This is about uh, people and country. This is not about you know, grand international chess games and abstractions. This is about what the weapons actually do. Um, so those were sort of some of the key principles. So there are now um, well over 600 international organisations that are partners in ICANN, some of them quite small, some of them very, very large, you know, the World Council of Churches, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, some political parties, um, some very large international organisations. Um, and there's certainly beauty and strength in that diversity. Thank you. That, that's so impressive. Um, but I'll turn to Dim Dimity now because of the exhibition art and activism in the nuclear age. I thought I'd ask how you see the connection between art and activism in um, your campaign and the effectiveness of that association. Well, yeah, sure. Thank you, Liz. It's lovely to, to be meeting with you all. Um, I think Tillman summed it up really beautifully when he was talking about our key founding principles of humour, horror, hope and humanity. And I think that that's something that runs through when you look at the kind of artistic expressions around the nuclear age, um, which has happened since the very beginning, since the very first use of nuclear weapons in the world, artists have been trying to interpret what went on with nuclear weapons. So we've seen them responding to that immense violence and the destruction caused by nuclear weapons with interpretations in music or painting, photography, dance, spoken and written word, films, and much more. And some of those people are talking about it from first-hand memories, so many Indigenous peoples, as you've heard today already, or Hibakusha, like Junkul Morimoto, for example, who was in this exhibition, this wonderful exhibition that's on right now. And others have had 
um, artistic expression from stories that have handed on or passed down through generations as well. A lot of people have also been inspired by um, the testimonies of survivors of nuclear testing to break through those pervasive silences that are imposed on unwilling communities by nuclear testing, by nuclear use, and also by the cradle to grave kind of nuclear projects that happen um, from uranium mining to nuclear waste dumping, from nuclear accidents, new misses, and all of those things in between. All of these things have sparked the artistic imagination. For me, I think of artists and activists both in this, are trying to understand what this is, this nuclear malaise that we talk about. You know, what we are trying to understand it, we're trying to make it visible because it's often an invisible thing. It's often uh, something that gets reduced in silences by a whole bunch of things, you know, through state silences, through military silences, through colonial silences and so forth. So the visions of artists have illuminated and focused attention on these issues, often positioning audiences as the eyewitnesses to the dire consequences of the nuclear age. And in many ways, that's what a lot of our activism is as well. We're trying to break out of those silences. We're trying to make people understand. We're trying to make people really feel that humanitarian impact, as, as Till was saying before, that really to get an acute understanding of the global existential threats again in front of mind about the nuclear threats. We really feel them lately. We really have been feeling those threats a lot in recent months, but also over recent years, as again, um, these threats have never gone away since those very first bombs were dropped in 1945. But both art and activism continue to strive to raise awareness and to be a catalyst for change as well. So for me, I see it very much as an interlinked thing. I think art gives voice, gives, gives leverage to these ideas. It also brings in a lot of creative energy, which is what we need. It's part of the ways of, of breaking down the immense um, nuclear amnesia that we tend to get and also the, and the sort of the, the just the sheer fear of it all needs to be broken down. So artists help us to do that by really sort of finding expression. And I think the exhibition that you've got on at the moment, which sadly being in Melbourne, I have not been able to see, but I'm hearing many beautiful things about it. And I, I think it's an, a real example of so many of those kinds of expressions as well. So congratulations to you all for, for your part in making that come through. Well, we thank you, of course, for the for the essay and, which, and both the essay and what you've just said is the most wonderful summary of the philosophy and the aims behind the exhibition. Even if you haven't seen it, I can assure you that it's kind of the realisation of, of what you've just said. Um, thank you. I was intrigued that both you and Tillman mentioned humour. And I suppose one wouldn't normally associate humour with, can you talk a little bit about the role of humour in, in your campaign? Oh, absolutely. And I think we've got some exit, or we've got some um, examples of that that we will show you oh. shortly as well. But I think humour is really important. And, and this was at our very beginnings, we had a wonderful one, um, uh, Felicity Ruby, who was our campaign, our, our founding campaign staff member. And she um, did a lot of consultations around the world with our international friends and helped us in the founding. And she identified this magic myth, mix of humor, horror, and hope to which we added humanity as we went along. Um, the, the humor is important because as I said before, there's such fear associated with these weapons and fear can be so debilitating. It can really freeze people in their thinking around things. If you fear it, you tend to shut down or you know you get that fight or flight kind of reaction. It is also something that is relied on greatly by many in power to talk about these as fearsome weapons that are just so overwhelming. What can you as one little person do about it? You know, it's, it's a really debilitating thing in itself. By tackling things with humor, we break down that fear response. We break down and break through this sense of like the overwhelmingness of it all 
and we try and sort of say right you know let, let's laugh at these people it's not a laughable subject at all in so many ways when you hear the lived experience of people you know that it's not a laughable subject but at the same time the what is laughable is the illusions and the abstractions that states who have these weapons continue to perpetrate and continue to put out there um, to justify their possession of these weapons, to justify their use of these weapons and to justify the threat of the use of these weapons as well. So um, breaking that down and providing a bit of leverage and a bit of levity in campaigning is a, an important part of it but also then respectfully grounding this work again and again and again in that lived experience, which is, um, which is so crucial to understand the lived experience of Hobakusha, for example, the lived experience of those who suffered from nuclear testing, those who suffer from the whole process of nuclearization from cradle to grave, as I said before. I think that's a really important thing that does not fall into humour, it certainly falls into the humanity, the humanitarian kind of approaches that we have as well. I think also the other side of this is, you know, the horror is important. You have to show the real horror of this. Um, you have to show how horrific these weapons are to get people to understand the threat that they're facing. But the hope thing is also really crucial. And I think it's Jem, Jem has said in the past, which I really love, this isn't a naive and placid kind of hope. This is a hope that has teeth. You know, we've got a whole toolbox of international law around this. This is a hope that we can actually see a world free from nuclear weapons. That's got to be the aim. It's not just about disarmament per se. It's not just about non-proliferation. It's about getting rid of these weapons because it's well past time that we did. So that's the kind of hope framework that comes in to that magic mix. Hope and, hope and humor. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. See that. Um, so I was going to ask Jen uh, what forms of activism and tactics have been the most effective in your experience. Yeah, thanks, Liz. And it's, I mean, it's hard to to pin it down exactly because we have so many tactics that we're always exploring and changing up we you know we look at our strategy continually as we go along and we try to uh we try to campaign uh as effectively as possible with the capacity and the resources that we have you know so it's always we're always thinking about what is most strategic but um i can give you sort of a broad brush strokes uh, view of some of the tactics that we use. Um, and that includes, of course, advocacy to decision makers, so all levels of government, building up support within political parties, uh, within their state branches, local branches, going to candidates before an election, uh, such as what, what we're doing now ahead of this federal election in just two weeks time now. Um, trying to reach them to talk about the treaty, for them to see this as the way forward and to take this on as something that they're willing to support and push for. Um, and of course, so many conversations with parliamentarians, so many meetings, some of them very frustrating, some of them very enlightening, um, but those conversations have been really, really important to our work. Um, and also with councils, we've been working with councils to take a stand on this issue and that you know often involves uh, people within that council area who are supporters of ICANN, who are activists in their own right, taking that forward and, and compelling those councils to declare their support for the treaty and that this matters to them as um, local government and as protectors of their um, constituents. And you know, building a movement is also essential for us to get where we need to go. And that means growing our network, partner organisations, engaging with different uh, different groups so for example faith-based organizations medical organizations students lawyers organizing events um one of my favorite things that we've been doing in the last little while is has been to sort of take take these people who are really engaged really on board and are 
are ready to do more than just sort of read emails and come to the odd event um, and to call them nuclear weapon ban advocates. And we've been supporting them and having meetings with them and they then take this forward and take the treaty to, to their parliamentary representatives, to their councils, to their super funds as well. Um, and this, this is good because it feels like that is actually building our power as a movement because it's not everything is coming through us or our partners, but it's regular people taking this on as theirs and um, building the confidence to, to demand action and to demand change as well. Um, other things that we do, uh, things in our tool, toolbox of tactics is of course, public speaking and creating resources, reports, booklets, so that we can be a trusted source of information and we can be recognized as authoritative on this issue. Of course, we're not just here to um, talk about peace and to talk about nuclear disarmament as a, a wonderful far off idea, but to actually see change happen. And I think the strategy of the treaty and getting Australia on board the treaty is a really meaningful contribution to that. So, you know, with all of these tactics, a lot of the work, Liz, is, is actually very boring and thankless. There's a lot of admin, there's a lot of emails, there's a lot of persistence, you know, trying to get someone to come on board. You're emailing them three times, you're calling them two times, you're trying to reach them on their social media accounts. And you may never win that person over, but for that person that you don't win over, you, there might be a couple that you do. So persistence is a very important part of the work. Um, and the conversations are critical. So getting the opportunity to explain why this, why this strategy is, is feasible, why Australia joining this treaty is feasible and inevitable. Um, and, and those one-on-one -on -one conversations really actually do, do make the change in small increments that, that we need to see. And I think really one of the best way, ways to win hearts and minds is through story and creativity. So central to our campaign has been to foreground the stories and the experiences of people that are impacted by nuclear weapons and, and through that appealing to everyday people's values. You know, of course we wanna end nuclear weapons. Of course we want justice for the land and the people that have suffered at the hands of these weapons. So now how are we going to do it? And that, you know, that's essential to connect you know, here is the harm that has been done, here is the problem, here is the issue that still exists today, and here is the pathway to change it. So if we can make that connection in people's minds, uh, then we're moving forwards and we're making it more inevitable that we do. Um, we're making, slowly making the future that we all want to stand in, in time. Um, and this, you know, this underlines the importance of initiatives like this exhibition that's been created so that we are reminded of the past and that we are honoring the victims um, and to also bring this persistent and real threat closer to the front of our minds. And, and that does change people's minds. So I, I just wanna give you one example of a parliamentarian who we were trying to meet with for at least a year and we would never get a refusal or an acceptance. We would just be ignored. Um, and then we were headed back to Canberra one day and I thought I'll put a request in, we probably won't get accepted, but I'll just put a request in um, just in case. And we, the request was accepted and we sat down with this parliamentarian and he said, look, I'm sorry, I haven't met with you. I know you've been trying to. Um, I recently went to Hiroshima with my family over the summer holiday and I now realize how horrific these weapons are. And uh, now I wanna do everything that I can to help you in your campaign. So, um, so for him, it was being exposed to the reality of the weapons and uh, being confronted with, uh, with his humanity, I guess. And that meant that whatever political difficulties he had coming around before, they was just swept away in the face of uh, understanding the realities of what these weapons do. So, I mean, to answer your question, I, th I think no single tactic, uh, but a diversity of them with clear goals and uh, staying, staying quite focused on, on the task at hand, being persistent and continuing to show up. And of course, being willing to try something for a bit and ditch it if it's not working um, and, and being flexible like that. 
And you mentioned, you just mentioned a parliamentarian, you mentioned uh, using the elections as a kind of platform. Does that mean that you approach all the candidates to see what their position might be on signing the treaty? How, how do you go about that? Yeah, there are many, many candidates, so we haven't approached all of them, but we have focused on the seats that are more marginal, where there's likely to be a change, um, and also seats where the exist where the uh, existing sitting member is is leaving so we've um, you know always we've got a spreadsheet a google spreadsheet for everything that we do <laughs> and of course we have a very thorough spreadsheet and we're just systematically going through and trying to get through on the phone or on the email to talk to them about this and I think now there are about 40 or 45 candidates who have said yes I support this so that if I'm elected I'll be added to your list of parliamentary supporters, uh, which is the parliamentary pledge, which is on our website. Um, and then hopefully we'd get the chance to then meet with them and talk, talk to them in more detail and then um, try to move them towards supporting the efforts to get the Australian parliament to deal with this and to actually get on with signing and ratifying the treaty. Labor doesn't have a position on this? No. Yes, Labor does have a, a position of very, um, Long standing, I would like to say, if, since 2018, can we call that long standing? <laughs> so December 2018 is when Labor uh, uh, adopted a, a policy to sign and ratify the treaty in government. And it has since been reaffirmed in 2021 uh, when the platform was, um, was created ahead of this election. And it has been, that position has been repeated a number of times by both the leader and the shadow foreign minister, Penny Wong. They've welcomed the entry into force of the treaty. Um, and I think currently about 80% of the Labor caucus in the federal parliament have signed the parliamentary pledge to indicate their support. So um, of course we, you know, we, are, we push all parliamentarians, we're nonpartisan in the work that we do um, and whatever the stripe of the Australian government, they need to sign and ratify this treaty. This is beyond party politics. This is a humanitarian issue. Um, however, we're of course, hoping to see swift progress on this if Labor is elected and, and we wanna see signature and ratification in a first term of government. I imagine that some of the independents, the teal independents so-called might be sympathetic as well. Yes, there are. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to show that slideshow now, Jen, perhaps? Yeah, so Dimity and Tillman and I had a very fun chat and we thought we'd like to show you some examples of our um, sometimes very daggy, sometimes sharp creative activism. Um, Cause it's some of, uh, you know, it's, it's that's some of the most enjoyable parts of the campaign as well to bring in that, that humor and that creativity. Um, so I will share my screen and we will just take turns to speak to um, each item. And yeah, we'd love to hear any comments or, or questions from the audience as well. All right, I'll call on Dimity or Tillman to kick us off now with this ridiculous. Well, this <laughs> This is, this is a wonderful, ridiculous and absolutely pivotal moment for the campaign right at the very beginning. This is um, Dr. Bill Williams, who is one of our other founders of ICANN. And he was a remarkable human being on so many levels. Um, also a member of IPPNW with Tillman, um, dear friend and, and mentor and colleague to myself and so many other people as well and dear friend and colleague for Tillman and other founders within the organization. But Bill had a, 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 a vivaciousness in his ways of being. Um, and he, I might turn my video off for a second. Um, my internet's a bit unstable, sorry. Um, and he, at the very beginning of our campaign, um, decided that one of the ways that we could reach out, especially to our international friends, as we were trying to build the idea of the movement, was to put himself in this kangaroo outfit and call himself the I Kangaroo. And this outfit went from the steps of Flinders Street to um, the international meetings that we held um, around the world 
through conference rooms in Basel and um, all sorts of different places. And it was a really pivotal moment, um, very funny um, thing. And it really captured the international attention. I Kangaroo became quite a feature and even used to turn up at some of the humanitarian conferences to help with the report backs. I Kangaroo was a very, um, yeah, a really fun part of that early activism for the campaign. Uh, this is um, Kaz Kazuyo Preston, who was the, the founder of Japanese for Peace in Melbourne. Um, and at the same, um, same location at iconic Flinders Street Station in Melbourne. Um, and it was really highlighting the striking parallels between Japan and Australia, uh, both countries, you know, bombed by, by nuclear weapons. Um, that ought to know better, you know, now claiming protection and providing assistance for the possible use of somebody else's nuclear weapons. Um, so highlighting this contradiction and, and the futility of, of the so-called uh, nuclear umbrella, which, you know, from the top looks more like a bullseye, um, was, a, is a, had, was then particularly a recurring theme in sort of creative uh, public. So building his kangaroo suit and... Uh, and Kaz in her uh, beautiful kimono, both with uh, with umbrellas. What if you want to speak to this? It's before my time. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, this was in 2010. Um, there was a performance that was done, a live performance outside the Harold Freeman Friedman um, mural, which stands at the top of Melbourne City, um, outside the uh, fire department, right at the top there. Um, it's a famous mural. It talks about the Prometheus myth and also sort of shows the work of fire people in Melbourne. At this time, of course, we just had the terrible bushfires a couple of years or the year before um, here in Victoria, the terrible bushfires that devastated. But part of Harold Freeman's um, mural is this big nuclear weapon explosion that's right in the middle of the mural telling, as, um, as Dave Sweeney says in the, in the film about this and the performance that was done live, um, it's a full step at the end of humanity. And right at the end, of course, it, for, for those of you who know the Prometheus myth, um, there is the, the tiny spark of hope that's left when, the, um, when, the, when all of these things go wrong. And so it was very symbolic for us to have this idea of that myth and talk about the impact of that myth. So this was both a performance live on the first day of the nuclear, the first nuclear abolition day internationally. And it was also um, a film that was made and you can find that on our website as well. And it was uh, beautifully, beautifully um, performed by Dave Sweeney, who's one of our other co-founders um, on the campaign as well. So this one was created by our um, Tim Wright, who, who, who many of you have been associated with, I can may know who was our for I think our first uh, staff member after after Demi, um, and who is extraordinarily creative as well as being a lawyer and good at everything. Um, so this was sort of a, an obvious play on the smoking analogy. Um, you know, products that are intrinsically harmful to health, um, of course, widely recognised, and and uh, you know the analogy being very. Um, very comparable, both being very big businesses, uh, both that are intrinsically harmful to health and both that need, um, need control. So this was one of the first um, sort of images that were used in the, in the effort to work for divestment. Um, there are massive amounts of um, both public and private money um, invested by, by banks and by superannuation funds in companies that profit from building the world's uh, worst weapons and in Australia you know super funds have probably somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 20 billion invested in those companies the future fund which guarantees um, 
public servant super fund has has hundreds of millions of dollars invested in some of the largest banks have have billions of dollars um, about seven billion at last count between them the four four large banks um, so this is serious money that legitimates and perpetuates um, uh, an intrinsically harmful industry that poses a, you know produces products that pose not just uh, intrinsic harm but an existential risk to everything um, so I think this was a, an appropriate sort of analogy um, to draw at that time with, you know, the, the easy recognition with link with smoking, but linking it to nuclear weapons. Uh, we've always had strong links with, with Japan um, and and the commemoration of of um, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, particularly with lanterns, um, you know, of course, is widely practiced around the world, and many beautiful images and messages on on those um, on those lanterns. Um, this was really in the early years when when ICANN was was starting to really spread and and take hold and be seen as a useful initiative. Um, globally, but of course, as um, as, as Dimity mentioned, um, making sure that those voices of those disproportionately affected are those for whom nuclear weapons are not some grand international chess game, but a lived daily reality of suffering and loss and displacement and ill health across generations um, is really important. So marking those occasions and honouring those victims and also putting their voice uh, front and centre has, has been a really crucial part of our work that for me combines very well with the sort of scientific and medical evidence that that I and others are, you know, particular custodians of and have a responsibility to, to share, um, but making that real for people um, with the lived stories is, is, has been a very uh, powerful way of, of reaching people and particularly during the negotiations and, and UN meetings that led to the negotiation and then adoption of the treaty, um, there was really nothing more powerful than having um, survivors uh, in the room. You know, you could hear a pin drop uh, when they spoke and they really touched the diplomats in a way that, that, that nothing else um, did. And when Elaine Gomez White, the president of the remarkable Costa Rican diplomat who was president of the negotiating conference, was asked, um, you know, what what led her to believe that the negotiations could be successful, apart from mentioning the the strength of the humanitarian evidence, um, it was looking into the eyes of the survivors every day and knowing that we couldn't fail. So um, those voices have always been. Um, a crucial part of our work of which I'm extremely proud. This was uh, another um, early um, action that was done again by our brilliant Tim. Um, what we did, what, what he did was um, make a stencil stamp of a bomb, which you can see there in the center of this picture and set up easels on the bridge, the main bridge in Melbourne, um, near the art centre. Princess and Bridge. The Princess Bridge, yes, that's one. Um, and have children and people passing by come and actually turn those bombs into something else. And there's a beautiful short film, I think it's on our website as well, about that, that, um, that beautiful action. And you see all these children creating these beautiful, <laughs> Um, interpretations of how they would rather see a bomb, how they would rather um, change that over. And it's part of that, it's part of that artis artistic expression, but it's also part of that hope for a better world. You know, how do we see it? So some of them got turned into things like cats, others got turned into vases or to fish or to all sorts of different ways. And it was really fun and beautiful, but also very poignant. I still get a bit misty when I watch the, uh, the film again. Um, to see these beautiful young things turn um, what are such terrible weapons into something much more positive and fanciful.
So I say something about this. This is Junko Morimoto. Um, in 2012, we organized with Japanese for Peace um, each for a number of years, each uh, August for the commemoration of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki anniversaries, some kind of, often it was a concert or um, or, or some other kind of, of, of public event um, prepared with, with really extraordinary loving care by mostly by Japanese for Peace. And this was one in the State Library in Melbourne in 2012, where Junko Morimoto, the children's author and illustrator um, who, who lived in Sydney for many years and produced many well-known children's books, including my Hiroshima, came and did this live painting, um, extraordinarily moving to watch her, uh, you know, her very slight frame who's in her really quiet but um, absolutely laser-like focus um, producing this extraordinary work over the space of about half an hour with just brush and ink um, on the stage at State Library and I'm, I'm really pleased that that work is, um, is in the exhibition at Tin Sheds currently. Um, Valle Junko Morimoto, she died a couple of years ago um, now. Okay, I can jump in here now. And uh, these are just wonderful costumes that um, were sewn by Tim, um, Tim Wright, wonderful Tim. And for a while we were advocating to the Future Fund to um, divest their holdings in nuclear weapons producers with the main argument being, you, know, you are divested from landmines, cost of munitions and tobacco, but not yet from nuclear weapons. Um, and basically, currently, the Future Fund now says that they will consider that when Australia ratifies the treaty. Of course, we say you shouldn't wait for that. You should do it immediately. These weapons are illegal under international law now. There's no legitimacy for them. Um, but we haven't been successful yet in getting the Future Fund to, to divest. But we did have a lot of fun going to their office and um, getting refused entry of course dressed up as as bombs <laughs> but it's it also keeps us going to to have a bit of cheeky fun with the campaign and as i recall jim there was so much concern about the security risk of having fabric nuclear weapons that you were asked to leave by the car park <laughs> yeah <laughs> <Well>, very threatening <laughs> um this is a still from a video uh we were gifted this large nuclear missile which actually formerly was a fuel tank for an airplane uh, and so we used it in a number of ways including um, making a film clip some of you might know the famous rihanna song umbrella um, and so i wrote, rewrote the lyrics to that song to be about the nuclear umbrella and rejecting rejecting it and saying we don't want your nuclear umbrella and the film clip featured a group of people in radiation suits carrying this missile through the streets of Melbourne, being very serious on a mission, and then eventually finding a dumpster in the back streets of, um, you know, Flinders Lane and all these areas near the near Fed Square and and ditching the bomb into the bin. Um, and of of course, we had some choreographed, uh, synchronized dance moves and all sorts of things. So uh, we've, we've, there's, it's also, the link is also um, up on our YouTube channel, but we can, I can share that in the chat later if you like. I think this is just an example of um, the various ways that we've fashioned the logo into stickers for your car or your computer um, and pins that you put on your lapel and of course temporary tattoos so that at international ICANN meetings you can have all these serious campaigners walking around and, and diplomats sometimes as well having tattooed the logo onto their bodies. This, uh, this movie was another one that was done by our friends in the United States. It's a really beautiful one. It was done early on, so 2015, and it was um, Nuclear Age and Six Movements. And it is a beautiful meeting together of music that was composed specially for this film 
and animation um, that was done. And it's, it tells the story of what happened with the nuclear from the Manhattan Project right through to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then the movements building and building as the nuclear weapons were building, the movements building as well to uh, resist them. And it's then the agreement to come together and dismantle nuclear weapons. It's a really powerful and beautiful piece. It's easily found um, on the internet as well. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just another example of some of our creative campaigners around the world, but our friends in New York who were, who were taking a lead in this. Oh, this is just another costume that we hired for a while. It looks a bit more like a chipmunk than a weasel, but that was the closest thing we could find to a weasel. And um, we would get wind of where Julie Bishop would be and uh, try to uh, go and meet her somewhere in public and, and ask her to st stop being a weasel. And this term weasel um, has become fairly established for a country that is weaseling out of their obligations and weaseling out of any commitments to actually pursue nuclear disarmament. So our very clear call to her is to stop being a weasel and to get on with <laughs> uh, supporting the, the process to ban nuclear weapons. Uh, so here's our beloved nuclear missile, which we, we took up to Mbantua, Alice Springs, and we took to the gates of Pine Gap in 2016 and borrowed some battery operated angle grinders uh, from some friends and gathered in this beautiful red dirt country and uh, took it apart. It was much harder than we thought. It took quite <laughs> a long time. Um, we, we ground down all of the grinding discs and we had to just pull out um, levers and spanners and any kind of tool to try to take it apart and it would, turned out to be very ridiculous and it took a long time but we got there and so I like to think that it's a bit of a metaphor for the process of banning nuclear weapons itself um, and yeah we created a film uh, to which is called How to Dismantle an, an Atomic Bomb and, and that, that film so I was just going to say that film was dedicated to Dr Bill Williams who had died just prior to us going up and doing that action so it was a dedication to him particularly and again it's on our website as well <laughs> and you'll be pleased to know that the pieces of the missile have now been converted again into garden beds <laughs> uh, this is um, a group of colleagues in in Helsinki um, who are emulating the, the extremely well-known Scandinavian uh, girl character in kids' stories, Pippi Longstocking, who's, who's very brave and courageous, uh, visiting the Swedish uh, embassy in Helsinki uh, with a couple of Pippis, um, making the case for Sweden to, supporting the, the Swedish foreign minister at the time, who was, who was having a hard time in cabinet and with her, some of her ministerial colleagues in getting Sweden closer to, to joining the ban treaty. Um, so Pippi and friends uh, made this visit to the Swedish mission in Helsinki. Um, you can see that the diplomats were pretty good humoured about it too. They probably hadn't had a lot of uh, visits from Pippi before. So this one, I don't know if it's so much creative as a bit more confrontational. Um, this was on the day that the treaty opened for signature. Uh, the 20th of September in 2017. And of course we knew Australia would not be there signing on the dotted line like it should be. So we decided to take the message directly to the Department of Foreign Affairs in Canberra with this massive banner. And we secret squirrel climbed up onto the roof there and stood there for a number of hours while the various TV cameras came and interviewed our people on the ground. Um, and yeah, that was that was a, a strong message to DFAT. Um, I think they, you know, of course, didn't come out to talk to us that day, and we were able to get down from the roof when we were ready, and we were not actually even arrested. It was creative, Jim. <laughs> I think it was a very creative way of doing things. Uh, 
this beautiful film here is the same people who'd done that earlier film um, that we saw as well, came together after um, at the United Nations in 2017 when the treaty was negotiated and 122 states had come together and, and um, signed up and agreed to this treaty. Um, Setsuko Tholo, who is uh, one of the Hibakusha from, from um, Hiroshima, and who's been a campaigner for her whole, her whole life um, to, to remind people of the impacts of those bombings in Hiroshima, particularly, but Nagasaki as well. Um, she came, she gave a speech at the end of that um, treaty negotiation, which is really powerful and very moving. And that speech has been turned into an animation of um, that by those same people in New York and, and the same um, creative team there. And it's a really beautiful animation, a really beautiful way of sort of capturing the story and capturing the enormity of the speech. So it's worth finding that one as well online. Yeah, this was during the negotiating conference in New York in 2017. And we took a group of campaigners and made these massive heads and um, staged a photo shoot and there were various props involved uh, basically as, as a stunt uh, for media and for our own morale um, and to call to very firmly call on the nuclear armed states to to be there they were all invited of course to this negotiating conference but decided to boycott it because they knew they couldn't stop the ban from going ahead they knew they couldn't control the agenda um, so we we're very much focused on on criticizing them um, for being missing in action Here's the Treaty Enforcement Squad, which is again a, an outfit that is uh, made up of treaty enforcers who go to where there is a breach of the treaty and uh, make, make good of, of that breach and fix it. Um, so it's a small group of, of people. It's basically a set of costumes that um, you know, anyone who wants to do some treaty enforcing can, can take up and use. And this was at the beginning of the, the squad in Woomera on Gugatha land in 2018, uh, when a group of us traveled out there on the Friends of the Earth radioactive exposure tour. Um, and since then, the Treaty Enforcement Squad has had some international appearances and it's also um, done an inspection of various sites at camp, camp in Canberra, which we might have time to show a short video of. Uh, this was our big bike ride from uh, Melbourne to Canberra uh, in 2018. And this was to tour uh, the treaty and our Nobel Peace Prize to uh, regional areas as we cycled those thousands of, you know, I think it was maybe about 900 kilometres um, over the course of, of a couple of weeks. And uh, this is, here we are in Wangaratta at the moment on our way with a good group of people. And we have these wonderful flags that uh, were made by some supporters in Port Adelaide. And we were greeted at the end uh, when we arrived in Canberra and here's a delegation of, of Labor parliamentarians, including Albanese at the front there, uh, welcoming us to Canberra. We also hosted a Nobel Peace March at the end of it um, on the 20th of, of September. And here's Auntie Sue Common Hasseldine, who's one of our uh, wonderful ambassadors. She's a Gugatha elder um, and she flew into Canberra for the finale of the bike ride. Um, and this is just a really favorite photo of her with the Nobel medal outside Parliament House that day. This, um, this was a, something that happened here in, in Nam in uh, Melbourne. Um, at Preston, uh, our local council at Darabin, so we, we do a lot of work with local councils around the country, in Darabin council actually decided to commemorate and honour the work of ICANN and particularly I was very honoured that they chose to um, highlight both myself and Dave Sweeney as two of the founders of the campaign and um, dedicate a mural to us. That mural then became a beautiful dedication to this man, Yami Lester. Um, and Yami Lester was um, 
a child at the time of the British nuclear testing in Australia in 1953 at Emu Field. And after that testing, um, he and many of his community suffered quite severe um, uh, impacts from the testing from the black mist that ran over the country. Uh, Yami became blind and, but he spent the rest of his life amongst the many things that he did. He was a very strong advocate for uh, land rights and many other things for his community. But amongst the many things he did was he spoke very strongly about the nuclear testing in Australia. And he was one of the pivotal people who made the Royal Commission um, into nuclear, the British nuclear testing in Australia happen in the mid 1980s. So it's a beautiful mural which honours both the place in which ICANN started here in Nam in Melbourne. And uh, we worked with local Wurundjeri elders to um, decide how to sort of merge these two stories, the place that ICANN began. And you can see on the left that runs all right around the building that side, but you can see on the left, there's Bunjil, who's the, the local, um, you know, um, important figure here in, in Nam. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, so he, they, there he's up there and then it turns into the land of Yami Lester and country. And we worked with Yami's family who all came to, um, or most of whom could, who could come, came to the launch of that in 2019. It was very beautiful and it still is a very beautiful mural in our community. This was an, an, a projection um, on the, obviously the side of the main UN building um, in New York on the day of entry into force of the treaty. So when 50 states had ratified the treaty 90 days later, it specified in the treaty that that's when the treaty would become legally binding for the states that had joined it then and for all those that subsequently do. Um, so a pretty significant occasion. It was a treaty that was negotiated um, at the UN. The depository is the Secretary General. It's a UN treaty. Um, and it was one of the, the first for a very long time, for decades, and probably one of the best um, examples of treaty making by the General Assembly, the most inclusive um, and democratic and fundamental organ of the United Nations. Um, so that was a really uh, clever and, and beautiful way of, of um, making such a huge <laughs> visible thing in such a prominent place via such a, a simple, um, you know, transient, uh, transient means. So the photographs uh, that exist of that time, it was broadcast in, in all of the official UN languages, including Russian and Chinese and Arabic. Um, yeah, it's a, it was certainly a, a beautiful thing on the 22nd of January last year. So on the 21st of, 22nd of January last year, uh, when the treaty entered into force, we, there were actions and events all around Australia. And, and here's the gathering of particularly medical professionals. This was organized by the Medical Association for Prevention of War uh, to bring people together on that day um, to celebrate really, to, to celebrate the fact that this treaty that so many said would not be feasible would not be possible to bring about that it had come about and it was now in force and permanent international law okay there's the link to the video um i just wonder if we should skim through to the end of the slideshow and then see how we're doing for time yeah ah oh, yes this is for anyone who's been to the exhibition in sydney you might have seen our seven meter tall our very own missile uh, there in the foyer. And this is really intended as a um, attention grabber and a prop to sort of bring this object uh, into, into our realm of vision. And it's, um, it's comical, it's kind of ridiculous. And uh, I think it will be a, a useful prop for the campaign around the world for many years to come. And did anyone want to say something quickly about our logo? And that's that's the end. The logo was designed in um, 
near Melbourne by 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 Bill Williams and and uh, and Neil Campbell, a wonderful designer based in Torquay in Melbourne, using the the symbol of um, the semaphore signs for nuclear for N and D that that had become this the peace movement symbol and particularly the symbol of the anti nuclear movement really since the late fifties, um, and entrap in that sign a broken missile. Um, it's extraordinary how much research you have to do on logos to make sure they don't resemble too many other things that are abound, around and make sure that they're not offensive in any in any culture that you could identify. Um, but this one's really stuck and I think it really is a beautiful link between sort of past and future. It honours the, the long history of um, of people's concern about nuclear weapons and, and work to eliminate them with this uh, well-recognised symbol, but um, showing where it's going. Well, th yeah, thank you for showing us that so, so many innovative and imaginative and effective forms of uh, campaigning. But I didn't know half of those, so it's wonderful to see them. I think maybe I'll just coalesce the last couple of questions I was going to ask so that we can open it up for discussion. I was going to ask about the future and future priorities, but I think maybe I need to be a devil's advocate and say, how, what realistic steps do you see that the nuclear armed countries can take towards disarmament? I was in CND way back, and that was one of the things that would be thrown at us constantly. Is Russia going to give up its nuclear arms first? US, China, is there going to be a gradual reduction in arms, which had begun? Uh, in the past, how how do you see, what hope do you see for bringing this this treaty into effect for the nuclear armed countries? I'm sure we'd all like to say something, but are you happy if I say something briefly? Um, look, that's their job. It's up to them to figure out how to do that. Um, but we know how to do this. Um, nuclear weapons numbers, as you pointed out, Liz, have been significantly reduced, in fact, by over 80%. Uh, now from a peak of over 70,000 to now just under 13,000. Some of those reductions have happened uh, via verified uh, and timely implementation of agreements to, in some cases, control numbers like the START treaties, and in some cases, like the INF Treaty, that got rid of short and medium range land based missiles from Europe, um, eliminated 1,762 of an entire class of nuclear weapons on time in a verified way. So nobody can say we don't know how to do this. We now have a nuclear comprehensive nuclear test ban infrastructure that's in place that can pick up nuclear tests very reliably of any size. We have extraordinary surveillance. Um, electronic surveillance, satellite surveillance that we didn't have before, uh, this can be done. What's been crucial to, if you look at the lessons of history, is that all of the other major types of indiscriminate and inhumane weapons, the other weapons of mass destruction, so-called chemical and biological weapons uh, for blinding lasers, for landmines, for, for cluster munitions, for each of them, what has been critical has been establishing an international agreement treaty instrument that provides the same standard for all states, so no nuclear apartheid, no nuclear weapons are okay for me and not for you, the same standard for everybody of zero, um, and provides the basis and motivation for the progressive efforts to eliminate the weapons. It's not complete for any kind of weapon. But we've made very significant progress on controlling all of those other kinds of, of weapons. And we have never made substantial progress on a weapon that wasn't first banned. That's the basic lesson of history. So what gives me hope is that, that this treaty matters, even though the nine, and in fact, what does give me hope is how much the nine nuclear armed states hate this treaty. Um, if this didn't matter, if this were just some you know, another piece of fine UN verbiage of which there are many that they could happily ignore, they would, no doubt about it. But 
they don't. They take this very seriously. They have opposed it every step of the way. And what did the US tell its NATO allies um, when it told them you must not vote for the negotiating mandate for this ban treaty? And if the negotiations happen, you better not be there. They, did, they said nothing of what they were saying publicly, that this would be ineffective, divisive, actually dangerous. Um, they said this would basically recognise this would work as intended. It would delegitimise nuclear deterrence. It would interfere with NATO nuclear war planning. Um, I, you know, the reasons they opposed it were because they see that it matters. And the other thing that gives me hope about this is if, is if you look at what happens with all of the other um, treaties. I mentioned cluster munitions and landmines before, opposed and not joined by US, Russia and China, biggest users and producers. But the use of landmines, it's their production, their deployment, their trade, their justification, and landmine injuries have dramatically declined globally, even by those states. The US now no longer produces landmines. Um, they only deploy them on the demilitarized zone in Korea. Um, apart from the anomaly of the Trump administration, every other uh, you know, during every other era, UN meetings that you would go to, you would hear UN dip US diplomats boast of their virtual compliance with the landmines ban, which they opposed and haven't signed. So these things matter. You know, it takes time. It doesn't happen automatically. It needs a lot of work by a lot of people to reinforce and strengthen that norm and to build it. Um, but it's the best hope we have. At the moment, it's the only thing in an extremely dark time. You know, the, the world is now closer to the brink of nuclear war than it's been at least since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. If we manage to survive this, um, you know, I, I, the one silver lining that I desperately hope for in this very dark cloud at the moment is that, is that a whole lot of people will, will wake up and, and realise the urgency of getting rid of these weapons so that we're not in this kind of predicament again with nuclear exercising and saber rattling and explicit threats and massive forces confronting each other with enormous risks of accident and misinterpretation and, and cyber warfare attack and um, it's it's a nightmare that that we simply have to avoid so there's nothing much else that's going well um, this treaty mattered because the nations of the world who get this problem who have nothing to do with the weapons realized finally that this was the one thing that they could do and do now and do even if the nine states with the weapons didn't want them to. Um, so it was a really important example of the assertion of sort of global humanity and democracy uh, in the space that's been the, you know, the fiefdom of the nine nuclear armed states for too long. So the treaty needs work, but we now have a situation in Australia where we have the alternative party of government, you know, with a reasonable prospect for being elected in two weeks' time, having a repeatedly affirmed national party platform saying we will sign and ratify this treaty. If Australia does that, um, it will be enormously significant. We would be the first so-called nuclear dependent state to kind of break ranks. And there would be ructions and waves and movement right across NATO, um, right across Japan, South Korea, um, other states that are currently part of the problem rather than the solution. It would be an enormous, um, enormously important thing. In fact, the most significant thing that Australia could do uh, right now um, to turn back the doomsday clock. I'd just add to that, if I could just quickly, that Australia would also be falling into line with our own region. You know, 10 um, of the Pacific nations signed and ratified this treaty to, because they understood the impact of nuclear weapons testing on their own countries. I don't understand why Australia keeps on ignoring the impacts of the nuclear weapons testing that happened here. But throughout the Pacific, it's very much acknowledged these terrible impacts of the terrible nuclear weapons tests that were committed by the UK, by France and by the United States over a 50 year period last century has really led our region to sort of understand this in a, in a very strong way. And so we've seen 
10 Pacific states already, and we've, we're having more who are coming on board, um, sign and ratify this treaty, and also ASEAN states as well, who do not have nuclear weapons, you know, that we're seeing more and more of them signing up as well. So Australia would be falling into line rather than what we're seeing Australia do at the moment, you know, talking about nuclear submarines and militarizing, uh, nuclearizing our military, et cetera. We would be actually coming into line with our, our region, coming into line with the expectations of our region and of our people as well, who very clearly say that we must fall into the category, the, the side of history that is getting rid of these weapons, not relying on them or professing a, a reliance on them, or indeed enabling these weapons as happens through um, the idea of extended nuclear deterrence. So it's an important thing. Um, we, we can actually influence how the nuclear weapon states understand this. We can actually influence a shift in norms and the understandings of the way these weapons have been utilized in the concepts of security. And we must do that as well. Very powerful answers. <laughs> um, Jen, uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, by the way, do put it into the chat function. I'm afraid there's not much time left. Jen, did you want to say, to add anything about the future or the um, priorities of campaigning now? Yeah, I will briefly, because I do want to give time for others to, to comment or to ask questions. But of course, we need to bring on more states uh, on board onto this treaty. Every single signature and ratification is a victory for the treaty. And there are dozens of states that are currently have signed or and are on their way to ratifying the treaty and to bringing those numbers up. Currently, it's 86 countries that have signed and 60 that have ratified. So um, the next big thing on the agenda is the first meeting of states parties, which is in June in Vienna. It's a UN meeting and that's on the 21st until the 23rd of June. And that'll be the first time that the, uh, the treaty community has come together since the negotiations. Um, and of course, the first time since the invasion of Ukraine. So um, I think it will be a, a very important time to, to show the world what the solution is and what the pathway to get out of this you know, dangerous uh, nuclear status quo, what that path is and, and the importance of the treaty as the critical tool on that path. So there will also be a um, humanitarian conference in Vienna just on the day before the first meeting of states parties begins. So on the 20th of June will be the fourth conference on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons, which will really continue to grow that humanitarian narrative and to show that these weapons are not deterrents. They are weapons of mass destruction that have no legitimate role to play in our world. And um, Australia has been to all of those prior conferences on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. So we're of course calling on Australia to attend that, that conference and to attend the first meeting of states parties. We can't uh, attend as a state party of course yet, uh, but we can attend as an observer and whoever is in government at that time must do so. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the next big thing. We'll be holding a series of events in four Australian cities over that time. So if, anyone is is not yet on our emailing list to find out about these things then please head to our website at icanw.org.au and we would love to work with you and to um, for you to get on board with the campaign because we need all the hands on deck to to get this to happen and as both Tillman and Dimity said um, getting Australia to join this treaty is top of our list here in Australia and it's um, it's we're on it we're on our way we have a lot of ducks in a row but it's still going to be a serious campaign ahead regardless of who is elected in a couple of weeks um, so please you know be part of this this movement we become nuclear ban advocates in fact yes I've just got a couple of comments really um, fantastic and inspiring presentation uh, Roman asks if you have any innovative um, activisms planned for Vienna, in fact, rather like the slideshow we've just seen. It's possible that our missile will be flying across the world <laughs> to join uh, everyone in Vienna. So that might that might play a role. Um, and there will also be an ICANN Civil Society Forum um, 
before the conferences I mentioned. So there'll be a lot happening there. And part of that forum will be to connect with hubs in different parts of the world. And I think that'll be connecting particularly to the Port Augusta event that will be happening on Sunday the 19th. But all the details of that will come. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there'll be much more planned for that meeting in, in Vienna. Just, I might just briefly add one of the things that I've been working on with an IPPNW hat is, and I'm really pleased and proud of this continuing collaboration that we've been able to, to, to facilitate between the major health professional federations globally. So the World Medical Association, the International Council of Nurses, the World Federation of Public Health Associations, the International Federation of Medical Students Associations have all joined with international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war in a very clear statement and supported by a, a briefing paper formally submitted to the negotiating conference about the that, that basically provides the evidence base that states need to act on as they deliver on the treaty and and, and drawing attention from a health perspective to the um, to the essential health imperative really to to implement the treaty as soon as possible There's only a few minutes left, and I know we have to end promptly for the next session. So I think what I might do is, is simply thank you very warmly indeed. Well, thank you for your work. I can't imagine how many hundreds and hundreds of hours you must have spent on this campaign. To have such, to have achieved so much in such a short time is, is really inspiring and, and impressive. And I know that we all thank you for your work for that most warmly. And thank you also very warmly for the presentation today, which was um, so um, detailed and so informative, summarized so well, the themes that we, um, see behind our, our exhibition and in fact has inspired us for about the last 10 years as we've had a whole series of, of conferences and workshops of which the exhibition is really the, the culmination. So I just thank you all again, just no, do read the chat where you have a whole list of people um, thanking you and, and praising you for your, for your work. So thank you again, um, we'll pull this session to an end and um, just uh, 50 minutes time, we'll have the next panel. Thank you so much, Tillman, Jem and Dimity. And uh, before starting, of course, this year uh, art and activism in the nuclear age, uh, has been, uh, uh, has had a uh, quite three years uh, his history actually uh, to organize um, into a being right now. But the organizing committee, um, Roman Rosenbaum, uh, Judy Skeen, and um, Judy Skeen and um, myself, of course, and so of course, it's Elizabeth Zelininsky and myself, four of them, and later uh, joined uh, Paul Brown. Uh, his knowledge of uh, Aboriginal uh, art and it, for that exhibition, uh, without his involvement, it's all, it was almost impossible. But we had a very good uh, session today, too. So it is a um, amalgamation of a whole of our effort. And uh, I couldn't thank enough to our members of um, you know, organizing committee. Thank you. Now, uh, the last session is also a very intriguing one because it's about no, and it is the um, very important part of Japanese culture, but now it has the international or universal uh, element uh, in its perform performing arts. So we are looking forward to uh, listening to your discussion. And later we will, uh, all audience will join you, you know, questions and answers and so on. So, but before I would like to acknowledge 
um, are Aboriginal uh, um, owners of this land, the Gajigo uh, people of Enora Nation, uh, who are traditional custodians of the land where University of Sydney stand. And this exhibition, uh, which is now in the uh, School of Architecture, um, that building is also stand here. So we acknowledge uh, their leaders past and present and those who are with us in this exhibition, all of us and today's symposium. The land we stand on here always was and will always be the Aboriginal land. So I would like to uh, um, introduce um, Emeritus Professor Alan Mallet. And Alan Mallet is an Emeritus Professor of Musicology at the University of Sydney. He has collected and published a number of original studies of Indigenous Australian music in conception and performance, as well as in, in relation to Zen Buddhism. Alan was the author of a new no play in English called Oppenheimer uh, about American scientist uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer and the development of the atomic bomb, that's what he did. And of course that dropped on Hiroshima 76 years ago on 6 August, 1945. It uses the uh, performance, Oppenheimer, uses the conventions of no, but all in English, and old Zen story about a fox to explore issues of uh, brilliant insight, horrific consequences, profound regret, and atonement. Um, so Oppenheimer was a collaboration between the author, Alan Mallet, profound, uh, sorry, and the composer, Richard Emmert, and the master actor teacher of the Kita, the Kita School of um, No. Uh, his name, classical No uh, performer, Akira Matsui. That's I was privileged to see the performance in 2015 at the uh, Conservatorium of the University of Sydney. So the performance featured the classical and the new um, masks of uh, no. That was quite you know, um, interesting, uh, little thing, but it's essential and very important things. And we are fortunate that uh, Alan lent us a mask, new mask, um, made by um, Kitazawa Hideta, uh, which, is, which has been dis displayed in the exhibition uh, today. So, and uh, we are, and so I would move to, um, sorry, uh, Yuki Tanaka, Professor Yuki Tanaka. And we are honored to have with us today, Professor Yuki Tanaka, Emeritus Professor of Hiroshima Peace Institute, where he had been leading scholar in relation of the uh, uh, wartime issues of comfort women in the Asia Pacific War, and on which he has published the foundation studies and on which has been core support researchers for the BBC documentary series in the year 2000. As well as he is associated with Melbourne University Asia Pacific Law Center. He has been published many of the core studies on the cultural and social history of Asia Pacific War and its aftermath, including the Tokyo War Crime Trials. 
Uh, his volume edited with uh, Marlene Young on the social and cultural cultural ramifications of uh, mass bombings in World War II has been an inspiration to those scholars working in this broad area. He is an old friend to this research group, same as in Alan Mallet in this regard, and he has been part of several of the early symposiums I think we started in the year of 2011 when Fukushima um, meltdown occurred. So we have uh, arranged in seminars and conferences in Sydney and Tokyo, and sometimes, not Tokyo, sorry, it's a Kyoto. And then we did that in um, South Korea, Seoul. So, in a, um, early Sydney meetings, one of the occasion he showed us, um, uh, it's a, he, he presented a paper about the, um, the visuality of catastrophe in Hiroshima in photograph, photography of uh, Fukushima Kijuro. That was a very memorable one. So his contributions to, um, to uh, uh, anti-nuclear uh, weapons and other, among other is in wartime issues, such as, you know, as I mentioned, the comfort of women, um, is a quite, is, is a sort of a um, foundation and it's a great study and for the future student to explore further um, because the world is unholding is a new, sort of a new area of uh, violence and nuclear threat. So maybe our, our individual power uh, can be small, but as we, we saw uh, icons um, innovative creative uh, activism when we saw it. And that is such an enlightenment. And same as what we are doing here is the um, creative activism. So both um, scholars, Alan Malit, Yuki Tanaka will present today about traditional no, how they are no um, performance is traditional but at the same time, it has a universal element and a powerful means to tell uh, the danger of nuclear um, weapons and war. So thank you very much for the participations. So up to you. Uh, who would be uh, starting? Could you show the, um, the a video that we requested? All right, yeah. Uh, the, yes, uh, it's ready now. We'll be showing the uh, video first. Yeah. Oh, no, that's, that's all, thank you. No, no, not, not that one. Not this not one. one. Haven't you got a link to that? Um... I thought, I thought, Alan, you sent the link to them? No, no I didn't. No. Oh, oh. I... <laughs> so that's, uh, could Alan, could you please share the video if you have a link? Um, I'd have to find it. Hold on. I'll, I'll have... Sorry. Oh, that was the only video uh, I was given. Just a moment, then I can I can show you um, probably. Um, just a moment. What is it? What is that? 
Ooh, where is it? Mm -mm, I can't find it. Hmm. Oh no, I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't find it now. I'm sorry. Well, then forget it. We, we just have to. We, we just have to um, start without <laughs> without um, a video. <laughs> uh, uh, if if it's a video on YouTube, could you um, try to remember the name? I can search that in YouTube. Anyway, don't worry. Well, okay. I'll, I'll start without um, without video. Okay. Um, can I uh, sh um, share the widget story? Um, yes, go ahead. Can I have the um, the um, the screen share? Can I have a permission yes. to have a screen share? Yes, you have the permission. Oh, I found the link. Oh. Have you? That's great. The video. Um, I well, what should I do? Should I just um, um uh, you can copy the link in yeah. the chat and pop that yeah. in the chat. Yeah. I can open that or you can share that. Yeah, okay. Um chat. Yes, yes. Okay. There here it comes. Okay, I'll share the video. Good. Thank you. Um, there's no sound. No, I can't hear. There's no sound. Yeah, yeah. I mean. So Lily, there's a there's a little box to to tick at the bottom left hand corner of the um, when you open the share screen thing that says um, uh, include audio or something like that. It's a green share screen here.ここ、神聖なエリアで、あの、向こうは、ま、人間のというエリア。こっちはちょっと神のエリアですかね。で、ここへ来ることによって私はま、あの、ピュアというか神の入り口に入ることができる。私の名前は<笑> 宇田川道重です。農学士であり農面作家です。能力を楽しむという意味になります。昔は猿学一番古くは江戸の猿関係で神さんとの関係が非常に深かった。演者は必ず仮面能面という仮面を使うこと。そして過去世の出来事を今。
よみがえらせるということすなわち能面をつけた主人公は現代の人ではなくて亡霊幽霊を扱うという。観客がその演者を仮面をなしで見た時にその人の顔の表情が見えてしまうと感じるものが薄くなってしまうそこから深く入っていけない仮面だとどこまでも深く入っていける。時代猿楽が、えー、発展していった頃は猿楽の小さなザグループがありましたそこのグループでは、えー、その太夫と言われるメインアクトがその自分の作った曲にふさわしい能面を自分で考えていました。時々演者で能面を作る人が、えー、いつの時代もいました。今は私だけです。その理由はやっぱり自分の演じる脳でどうしてもこの表現が、えー、必要だ。その表現を必要な能面を自分で作らないと。えー、他の人が作った能面では不満足今回の「東雲の」はリハーサルはありませんのでいきなり、えー、本番ですからかなりクオリティの高いものをすでに作っていないとできませんやっぱりこの、えー、考えて「の」を舞う例えば「考える」というのは次の歌う言葉は何だったとか次はこんなふうに舞おうということを本,本番で本当の舞台でまだ考えてやっているようでは、えー、それはダメです。何も考えなくてもそれが自然に出てくるそういう,うレベルに達した時にキラッと光る瞬間に偶然性というかキラッと光る素晴らしいフレッシュな光それが本当の脳の美しいところです。大体月に1回は必ず
、うん、行ってますし斧を無事に終わりましたという報告はしますし次々にこの舞台があります。脳だけではなくお茶お花あるいはまあぶどうも含めてそして祝詞をしてやがてはまあ博物館のようなことになってしまうと誠に申し訳ないしもったいないと,と思います。伝統芸能を、ま、守ろうという運動を一つの大きなウェーブにして広めていかないともう日本は経済を生むだけのロボットの国になってしまう続いてきたということは意味があるということに分かんなりませんのでこれからも伝承していかないといけないという責任を感じます。Just want to share the, my、um, screen. Okay,、um, just a moment. So, okay. Right.、Uh, can you see the、uh, screen?、Uh, the... Yes, yes, we can. Right, thank you very much.、Um, no is the oldest、um, Japanese theater art,、um, which was developed by Kanami and his son Zaomi in the 14th century based on the various、uh, ritual offering dances、uh, previously performed. And it is a complex combination of acting, dancing, and music, and is still performed at many、uh, places in Japan. Um, <clears throat> there are about、um, 240 traditional plays of no currently performed.、Uh, no plays can be broadly divided into three categories、um, Genzai no,、uh, real no, which,、uh, which features、uh, human characters and unfolding events happening to those people, and then Mugen no, supernatural natural law, no,、uh, involves the supernatural world. Highlighting ghost, spirit, god, or phantoms, and actions、uh, may switch、uh, between multiple time frames and include uh, uh, flashbacks. That Udaka that talking about in the video,、uh, he was mainly talking about the, this uh, supernatural uh, uh, no. And then Ryokake no,、um, mix no, is a hybrid of the real and supernatural plays. <coughs> Many of、uh, Mugen no plays are known as Shuramono,、uh, battle stories, mainly based on Heike Monogatari,、um, the tale of the Heike, a set of narratives about the Genpei war between the two most powerful samurai clans, the Taira and the Minamoto,、uh, conducted between 1180 and 85, as well as the events leading up to the conflict. The Genpei War was one of the、uh, turning points in Japan's medieval history. The tale of the、uh, Heike is、uh, considered one of the best classics of medieval Japanese literature based on the actual history of the Genpei War. All the Shuramono plays are structured on a similar narrative basis. An itinerant Buddhist monk known as Waki. Or supporting actor、uh, visits a historical place and meets a mysterious person known as Shite or main character. And this enigmatic person usually、uh, appears as an old man or woman, but is in fact a ghost.、Uh, this character gives the monk a short reminiscence of bygone days in the historical place, and then 
disappears from the stage. While the monk is still uh, reflecting on the reminiscences, uh, Ste reappears as a ghost, uh, revealing the true identity of the character, perhaps a warrior, noble person, or an elegant lady who tragically died at, the, um, at that location. In some plays, additional actors, uh, companions of Waki and Ste also uh, appears. As Udaka uh, explained uh, in the video, a Ste as a ghost wears a mask and does not show the character's face in order to hide the distinctive personal uh, personality of a living person. On the other hand, Waki does not wear a mask representing an actual living person. Ste always appears on the stage having walked along a bridge-like long corridor uh, called Hashigakari, which connects to the main front stage, uh, signifying that Ste returns to this world from the land after, the de uh, after death. Um, the picture on the uh, uh, left-hand side is the, uh, a theater, and the left side of the uh, theater, you can see the uh, part of the corridor. And the right-hand side is the Ste walking uh, Hashigakari towards main stage, uh, uh, and um, so uh, this is the how they 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 act uh, stay act, and um, then the on arrival uh, arriving at the stage uh, front, the ghost tells the monk how horrendous and painful the experience has been, and explains that the ghost is uh, unable to rest in peace uh, because of the particular emotional problem. This emotion may be sorrow, remorse, hatred, anger, fear, jealous, despair, love, or something else, depending on the uh, various plots of plays. In some plays, for example, the ghost is, um, uh, is a mother who went uh, mad uh, through losing her child. Uh, at the climax of speaking out, the ghost dances to express the disturbing emotion. And then the ghost walks on Hashigakari back to the land of the death, dead, requesting the monk to pray for peace and tranquility for the ghost. In short, the ghost comes back to this world, seeking the monk's help to secure a peaceful life after death. Uh, one of the fascinating attractions of No is that the audience is able to hear the tragic stories and pain directly from the deceased victims of war, although in an imaginary form. Uh, by the end of the play, the ghost is healed, uh, gaining solace through sh uh, sharing the pain with the monk. Together with the monk, the audience also encounters the ghost and listen directly to the testimony of the war victim who may have died several hundred years ago. Accordingly, the entire audience is also obliged to uh, internalize the victim's pain and in that way is able to hold and contain a collective sense of internalized pain of the war victim. One of the distinctive functions of Mugenno is to uh, show the audience the life after death, uh, making what is invisible in this world visible through the ghost uh, testimony. In this sense, uh, No is a unique theater art in internationally, as many of its main characters are ghosts. Um, in No Place, Ghost appears in front of the audience, traveling beyond time and space to the present day and speak directly to the audience. Therefore, it is unsurprising that their stories uh, deliver universal and timeless messages precisely because those messages come from beyond. In addition, most of uh, each play is written in deeply symbolic verse. Uh, therefore, although the stories are based on particular historical events, the way in which the stories are narrated also takes on a universal form. Uh, in recent years, uh, modern no plays have been written and performed and uh, many of them are Mugenno, uh, the supernatural novel. Among them, 
uh, the works by the Tada Tomio uh, are outstanding and can be used as, a, as an effective way to pre preserve Japan's cultural memory of war. Tada produced modern no plays focusing on Japan's J Japanese as war victims as well as assailants. Uh, interestingly, Tada was not a, a professional no actor. He was a, a, a world-renowned immunologist, but his hobby was the uh, playing uh, a shoulder uh, drum, one of the instrument, musical instrument uh, used for no. Uh, two of his uh, uh, concerning uh, two two of, of his plays uh, concerning uh, war victims use atomic bombing uh, bombing theme. Uh, one is called Genbakuki, anniversary of the bomb, and the other one is Nagasaki no Sebo, the holy mother of Nagasaki both of which uh, brilliantly symbolize the cruelty and the inhumanity of the bombing. Um, the, it appears that Tada was always deeply interested in symbolic expression of words, uh, perhaps owing to his interest in literature uh, from an early age. However, he believed that the writing many detailed descriptions of the war tragedy would not necessarily impress or uh, influence readers. For example, in one of his essay collections, he explained that he read numerous testimonies of airborne survivors in order to write uh, the anniversary of the bomb, yet soon realized the, uh, the enormous difficulty of using detailed information about unspeakable experiences of the survivors. Eventually, he came to the uh, conclusion that, quote, no matter how many terrible episodes of the atomic bombing I collected and re read, I could not use them for writing uh, a no play. What eventually solved this problem was the uh, symbolism and the universalism of dramaturgy of no. Um, in this sense, probably you can say that the, the similarity between the no and the other uh, fine arts like painting. Uh, this particular one is the, uh, um, the uh, by Shikoku Goro, very famous painter who uh, drew, drew many uh, picture, pictures uh, related to atomic bombing. Um, so simply making people listen to as many survivors' testimony as possible would not necessarily uh, convey the essence of the tragedy of the nuclear attack to achieve this aim, Tada believed it, uh, it was virtually, uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, vitally important and far more effective to reach the fundamental uh, nature of the impact of the atomic bombing and express it in a highly symbolic manner. Uh, it is necessary to actually watch a performance in order to understand and appreciate the value of Tada's no play, but we can't do it uh, uh, now. So I just want to explain about the, uh, the, the, uh, his, his play. Uh, Genbaki, Anniversary of the Bomb. The story is of the ghost of a man who was killed by the atomic bombing of Hiroshima uh, 60 years ago, who tells his tragedy to a Buddhist mom, uh, monk who has come to uh, Hiroshima on pilgrimage. At the end of the story, his surviving daughter, who is now elderly, encounters her father's spirit at the riverside while she is trying to release a paper lantern on the water to console his father, her, her father's uh, traumatized soul. Her father dances, telling her how he died, uh, wandering around the totally ruined city, seeking water and trying to find his daughter in the radioactive black rain caused by the bombing. He sang, uh, uh, seek uh, though I might, amid the rage, uh, raging flames, there was no water. Seeking help, begging for water, I scrambled up onto the Tokiwa Bridge and gazed and gazed at Shadow River, all pitiful. Everywhere I looked, corpses heaped uh, one on the other and no places to tr uh, tread between them. Oh, where is my child? I cried again and again as loud as, uh, as, as could. 
uh, covered in drifting smoke and flame. The street of Hiroshima and six rivers were buried in dead bodies. And so a thin dress that seemed familiar, I ran over thinking it my child and caught her up in my arms. Uh, oh, pitiful. It was a corpse of an unrecognizable child. The, the Holy Mother of Nagasaki is a story about an old woman from a, a place called uh, Tsuano uh, near Nagasaki. Here, many local people who had com, uh, converted to Christianity, despite the prohib prohibition of this foreign religion, were tortured and killed by the authorities, even as late as in 1868, the year that the uh, feudal Tokugawa shogunate regime uh, collapsed and the sup supposedly new modern state government was established under the restored uh, emperor system. This woman, probably the incarnation of the Holy uh, Mother, appears in Nagasaki shortly after the atomic bombing and dances and prays for the uh, for salvation of the souls of the victims of the bombing and for world peace. Um, anniversary of the bomb and the Holy Mother of Nagasaki uh, often performed outside of Japan and many people in the audience uh, mentioned their spiritual experience of the uh, saddening and healing. For example, an audience member who watched the play uh, the Holy Mother of Nagasaki, performed in New York in 2015, st st stated that the play reminded her of the tragedy of the September 11 uh, te terrorist attack. Among other, uh, sorry, huh? what happened? Oh yeah, this one. Uh, among other uh, modern no plays focusing on the atomic bombing is Genshingumo. The Mushroom Cloud, composed and performed by uh, Uraka Michinori, uh, a shite actor who also made his own no masks, as we have seen the, uh, in, the, in this video. In this play, a mother who lo uh, loses her small child to the atomic bombing eventually reaches the gate to the land of the dead after uh, frantically searching everywhere for the child. There she finds her child who has metamorphosed into a young willow tree. She is informed by a monk that the child will be ultimately reborn if she keeps praying for peace for all the people uh, killed by the bombing. She is consoled by these words and returned to this world. Udaka wrote this play uh, inspired by the September 11 attack in 2001 uh, one, and in 2007 the play was performed in German city of Dresden, which was completely destroyed by the Allied forces of firebombing in World War II, and also played in Berlin and Paris, and garnered uh, excellent reviews in each city. Uh, two of Tata's uh, other no play highlight the brutality of the Japanese against the Okinawans and Koreans. Uh, the play on Okinawa uh, is called Okinawa Zangetsuki, a record of the moon at the uh, dawn in uh, Okinawa, uh, eliminates the hellish battle of Okinawa and atrocious uh, treatment of the Okinawans by the Japanese troops. Okinawan became victims of appalling atrocities committed by the Japanese due to racial and cultural discrimination against the Okinawans. The civilian uh, death toll 94,000 was almost the same number of the military deaths. Uh, many Okinawans died of starvation and malaria uh, during the 11 week battle. Uh, the, the play on Korea, uh, Koreans is called Bo Kong Ka, uh, a, a lament for the uh, uh, unrequited uh, grief, uh, reveals the deep sorrow of an uh, old Korean uh, woman uh, whose husband was taken away many years ago to Japan as a forced laborer and died there. Uh, Ten millions of Koreans were forced uh, to m migrate to Japan between 1939 and 45 as the Japanese uh, government tried to su supplement of labor shortage uh, uh, resulting from the conscri conscription of a large number of Japanese men for the war. Uh, by the way, 
of the 230,000 people who died by the end of 1945 as a result of the atomic bombings, uh, about 30,000 were Koreans in Hiroshima and 10,000 were Koreans uh, in Nagasaki. In this way, uh, magnificent tree demonstrate the process of working through the past by using the classic art form of no focusing on the duality of war tragedies, uh, those the US imposed on the Japanese, as, as well as those the Japanese imposed on others. Tada's modern no is an ideal model of Japan's cultural mem uh, memory of war. Uh, another excellent example of modern no play is Jacob's Well, written by Austrian psych psychiatrist Dr. Diesel Leopold in collaboration with Shimizu Kanji, a professional uh, no actor in Tokyo who plays often uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Tada, uh, Tada's um, uh, modern uh, no. The story is about two Jews who meet a Palestinian woman at Jacob's Well. The woman tells the story of a Jewish man who gave uh, some Italian women water from this well, even though the Jews avoided contact uh, with the some Italian uh, hundreds of years ago. This no is based on the story of John's Gospel of the New Testament, in which two opposing people uh, peoples share the water of a well in the de desert. Uh, it questions the constant conflict between ethnic groups and religions in the world and highlights the symbolic meaning of sharing water. So, conclusion. Uh, in this way, the Japanese no is now becoming a, a global art because of its striking and powerful symbolism conveying the universal message of peace. One of the excellent examples is the Alan uh, Maritz uh, uh, Oppenheimer. Uh, he will talk about uh, after this. And it is my belief that Japanese people, in particular as citizens of Hiroshima, should be aware of this world trend, appreciate its value, and think carefully how to utilize this distinctive performing art as the cultural memory of war. Creating more modern no plays based on Japan's war experiences uh, as both victims and assailants, for example, on the theme of the Japanese military sex slavery, the so-called Yan Sedo, uh, would be a further promotion of this uh, treasured culture. Through such an imaginative cultural memory uh, movement, uh, Hiroshima has a potential to become the world cultural center of war remembrance from which the truly global and universal messages of peace can be sent to the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Tanaka. That's great. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, can I ask quickly one question? Uh, why Tada um, um, Tomio um, focusing on the aggression of Japanese um, army? Um, because it's, that, that area has been neglected uh, to not to be noticed by uh, common Japanese people because of uh, you know, lack of education or lack of information. Um, but Tada uh, Tomio you know, um, picked up that sort of uh, uh, Japanese aggression, army aggression, and put into uh, no and expressed that uh, importance of. Uh, you know, acknowledgement or what we have done. So how come he noticed that uh, you know, sense of uh, um, atonement, you know, what we, we did, um, Japanese uh, Imperial Army did? Can you uh, answer that? He doesn't, he doesn't explain why he, he was interested in the Japanese um, the atrocities uh, of, of wartime. Uh, but I th I, my guess is that he actually learned how important to, to tell the, um, the, the atrocities committed by Japanese as well through his um, study or through his hobby of the no. 
classic novels because classic novels, as I said, explained the full of stories about the atrocities, uh, atrocities committed by both sides, um, Heike and Genji. So uh, it's natural to develop this kind of idea. So it's not just we are victims, but also the perpetrators. So I think it's not surprising that he actually gained this idea, the universal ideas, um, uh, the universal philosophy of, of the, um, of, uh, you know, uh, yes, on, on the human rights issues. Right. Yes, I, I understand that because the, the, uh, it's a no has the um, distinct symbolism and through the appearance of ghosts, ghosts telling us stories. So thank you so much indeed. I think we have to move to uh, Alan's um, Oppenheimer and how uh, Alan has been influenced by this uh, yeah, symbolism shown in no performance. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Yasuko. Uh, good, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Ghana country in South Australia, where I now live and work. And I pay my respects to traditional owners of the past, present and the future. The title of my presentation is Oppenheimer, a modern null play for the nuclear age, karma, suffering and liberation. And of course, it forms part of our panel, the power of traditional Japanese null theater in the nuclear age. So the focus of my presentation will be my null play, Oppenheimer, which conforms in most regards to the traditional forms of Japanese null theater. That is with regard to staging, costumes, masks, dance, movement, music, and overall structure. We could say that Oppenheimer has the typical structure of a Mugen no. It departs from traditional no only in that the play is in English rather than Japanese, that it uses a new Oppenheimer no mask made especially for this play by Hidata Kitazawa, um, as Yasuko mentioned, and takes as its subject a modern protagonist, that is J. Robert Oppenheimer, the so-called father of the atomic bomb. What I plan to do in this talk is um, to discuss issues of karma, suffering and liberation um, and how they're treated in Oppenheimer and in traditional Noel. Um, and then in the second half of my presentation, um, I want to show two video clips from the 2015 production of Oppenheimer. These will be subtitled in English and Japanese. Oppenheimer conforms to the conventions of Noor not only with regard to its forms, uh, its staging, costumes, dance, and so on, but also in a much more fundamental way. Like many traditional Japanese Noor plays, Oppenheimer narrates a story at the heart of which lies great suffering. In traditional Noor plays, this suffering might be caused by war, as in the second category warrior plays, uh, plays like Atsumori, or by loss of love or uncontrolled jealousy, uh, as in the third category women plays such as Izutsu, or fourth category plays like Aoi no Owe. One of the things that most Noor plays have in common is that the protagonist's suffering, which is manifested as they're being tracked in some ghostly form or some demonic form, is resolved through some sort of Buddhist awakening or liberation. Very few plays leave their protagonists languishing in a hellish state. Oppenheimer comes close to doing this, but it too has as its ultimate focus, liberation from suffering. Of course, while traditional no plays focus on their protagonists and their stories, whether these are Atsumori and Kumagai in the case of Atsumori, or the daughter of Kino Aritsune and Izutsu, or Lady Rokujo in Aoi no Oe, they're not primarily about these characters as individuals. 
their more fundamental concerns are more universal in that they address, first of all, the cause of suffering, which in classical Buddhism is seen as resulting from greed, aversion and ignorance. And secondly, the ways in which a radical shift in our understanding of reality in the way that we see the world can liberate us from this suffering. In the case of Atsumori, this release occurs when Kumagai's repentance for killing Atsumori in combat is embraced and welcomed by the, the ghost of Atsumori. In the case of Izutsu, the liberation of the daughter of Kino Aritsune comes when she looks into a well, sees her reflection, and realizes that her long lost lover is not, in fact, separate from herself. In Aoi no Oe, Lady Rokujo is liberated primarily through the actions of a shaman, a Yamabushi, a mountain priest. But the precise moment of transformation and release comes when she hears a passage from the Prajna Paramita Heart Sutra. And as a result, she renounces her demonic ways. In the case of Oppenheimer too, the ultimate focus is not so much upon the suffering and liberation of the protagonist, Robert Oppenheimer, even though at the surface level of the narrative, this might seem to be the case, but rather on the more universal theme of suffering or more precisely, the way in which human beings, indeed all beings, have suffered and continue to suffer as a result of the creation and deployment of nuclear weapons. The reframing within a broadly Buddhist um, framework of the conventional narratives, narratives of victimhood, narratives of victory, narratives of horror, narratives of guilt, for example, not only liberates Oppenheimer from his remorse and guilt, but more importantly, it can liberate us, the audience, from such limited views. Of course, it's inevitable that some people will interpret no plays only at the level of the surface narrative and not see into their deeper significance. When Oppenheimer is viewed in this way, as it has been by certain people who are closely associated with the survivors of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, the Hibakusha, this has led to criticism of Oppenheimer for focusing too much on the sufferings of the perpetrator of the crime, Robert Oppenheimer. In rejecting the play Oppenheimer, one such person said to me, we're simply not interested in the pain of Oppenheimer. While as Yuki Tanaka has pointed out in his forthcoming book, views that center only on the pain of the victims limit the potential for healing and reconciliation. I nonetheless wish to deeply honor the pain of the victims of such hideous crimes. Just as I honor the pain of the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and their families and descendants, so too do I honor the pain and anger of indigenous Australians who have suffered profound trauma as a result of the brutal colonization of this place that we now call Australia. Including, of course, their being exposed to the British Australian nuclear tests at Maralinga. Um, and I'd really like to express my gratitude um, for the very powerful session um, that we had this morning, uh, focusing on indigenous artworks um, about, Mar about um, Maralinga. But as Marcia Langton once said to me, please don't feel obliged to take on the trauma that Aboriginal people feel. That will simply paralyze you. If you do this, you will not be much use to us. In Australia, non-Aboriginal people have their own struggle as individuals and as a society to come to terms with what was done by the colonists and settler society and the fact that we continue to benefit from that. Just as we must also struggle to come to terms with the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One of the most positive and I believe appropriate things that we can do in the face of our struggles is to seek to understand 
the roots of such brutality and to act to ensure insofar as we can that things do not happen ever again. This is the point of Oppenheimer. A central theme of Oppenheimer is the role of karma, the law of cause and effect, and how not paying attention to the consequences of our actions can lead to disaster. This theme focuses on Robert Oppenheimer's being blinded by his infatuation with the technical challenges and the beauty of the physics that he and his team worked with in the Manhattan Project. It explores how a basically decent, highly educated and cultivated man could perpetrate such a terrible crime against not only the peoples of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but upon endless generations of people who must in future live under the nuclear shadow. When Oppenheimer appears in the first act of the play, he is a ghost. But in the course of the first act, it becomes clear that this ghostly Oppenheimer is suffering deeply. Trapped in an endless cycle of birth and death, he is condemned to return to Hiroshima each year on the anniversary of the bombing and to live out the pain of those he condemned to burn alive in that Holocaust. And each visit redoubles his pain. In the course of the first act, however, Oppenheimer comes to realize that the source of his pain is at the deepest level, his refusal to accept the consequences of his actions. Finally, he resolves to willingly enter the flames of Hiroshima, which are conflated with the flames of hell and to remain there unmoving for all eternity. In this way, he radically changes his relationship both to the consequences of his actions, that is his karma, and to the pain he caused. Rather than denying these, he becomes one with both his karma and pain, which he takes upon his own body. As most of us would be aware, not taking responsibility for the consequences of our actions, whether this involves the creation and deployment of nuclear weapons or the brutal colonization of an indigenous people such as happened in Australia, this blocks all possibility of healing and reconciliation. On the other hand, truth telling, getting the story straight, taking responsibility and making restitutions can be our first steps towards healing. So I'd now I'd like to play the section of the play where Oppenheimer resolves to accept his karma and by choosing to enter the flame to take on the pain of his victims. Hmm. It's Oppenheimer. Yeah, um, it, I think it's... Um, Somehow, no. Somehow, when we went into that before, um, accidentally, it seems to have. Um, disappeared from my screen. Um, ah. Uh, no. Ah, what a pity. Um, Lily, are you, you there? Okay. So, uh, yes, if you can put that up, I can cue it. This one, right? This one. Uh, I'm just, yeah. Yes, can you just play that and I'll I'll cue. Uh, I need you to stop sharing and I'm going to share you the link. I have stopped sharing. Okay. Just bear with me, folks. I just need to do that.
I'm not sure that I can cue it, um, Lily. Are you able to cue it to one hour, 11 seconds and 40? Uh, Sorry, which, which time? Yeah, so one hour. Uh -huh. yeah. One hour and? Uh, 11, 40. Okay, then we can go. Yeah. Great. Right, we can Okay, we can stop the video there, thank you. Um, and I'll have another example in um, uh, just a few minutes, um, Lily, which will start at 121.12. 
um, but I've just got a little bit to read before then. Once Oppenheimer has made his momentous decision to enter the flames and remain there, he receives help from an unexpected quarter. When in the midst of the flames, he encounters one of the four great Buddhist wisdom kings, Fudo Myo. Like Oppenheimer, Fudo has resolved to dwell unmoving in the midst of flames. Fudo literally means unmoving. But for all his unmovingness, he is still able to act on behalf of humans to remove impediments to realization, to awakening. In one hand, he carries a snare with which he captures our delusions, the sort of delusions that caused Oppenheimer to create the atomic bomb. And in his other hand, he carries a sword with which he cuts them off, thus liberating us from them. Fudor offers Oppenheimer his sword and snare so that he too can liberate people from such delusions and in this way save the many beings of the world. But what does this mean? It means that we can turn the story of what happened at Los, Los Alamos, Hiroshima and Nagasaki around and by seeing clearly into the fundamental ignorance and inhumanity that underpinned these events, we can begin to liberate ourselves from our paralyzing trauma, fear and guilt. By reframing the story of Robert, Heim Robert Oppenheimer as a story of liberation and hope, rather than a story of victimhood and despair, and by emphasizing that all of us are like Fudor and the awakened Oppenheimer, free to act in our own way for the benefit of the many beings of the world in whatever form that takes. So I'd now like to just um, uh, play the final section of the play after uh, Oppenheimer has encountered Fudor. Thank you. 
Whoops. Thank you. Um, I just have a few short words to say in, in conclusion. Um, Oppenheim is dedicated not only to all victims and survivors of nuclear war, it's dedicated to the whole of humanity and indeed to all beings. It seeks to reframe the narrative surrounding the creation and deployment of nuclear weapons in the light of Buddhist wisdom just as traditional no plays reframed stories of sorrow and loss from medieval Japan. It's about liberation from suffering. It's about how we talk to ourselves about living in the nuclear age, how we can be liberated ourselves from paralyzing anxiety, how we can empower ourselves and others to act against the horrors of war. Thus an ancient wisdom tradition operating within the context of a medieval Japanese art form is brought to bear upon the very modern issue of nuclear weapons and the dangers that they pose for the future of us and the many beings of the world. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Alan, and thank you so much, uh, Yuki. Now, um, it's just the overwhelming the wealth of uh, um, you know, nuclear art culture. Um, so I just open for the uh, um, questions from the audience. Um, See how the, we can start from uh, from the chat. What do you think? Or uh, yes, oh, oh, there it is. Yeah, Judith. Yes, hello. Um, Yasuko, did you yeah. call me? Oh, I yeah. want Thank you. Thanks. For raise hands. So. Yes, I did. No, indeed, I did. That was absolutely wonderful to see that. I saw the Oppenheimer at the conservatorium and I thought it was fantastic. But I wanted to actually make a comment to Yuki, if that's all right. Um, what, and actually relating to his work on mass bombing, he's one of the great foundation figures in mass bombing. And I I was t incredibly interested in when you talked about Tada Tomio, as, as um, Alan did too, the idea that dealing with mass, um, mass violence and ma mass victimhood, that it's, it's useful to think of it in universal terms and, as a, and in, in symbolic terms. And I have been incredibly influenced by Thomas Lecour working on bombing in the 1930s. And he, and I found it very interesting because he says in the kind of humanitarian efforts to deal with things like mass bombing, you must um, individualize these things that people can't deal with these universal ideas that what you do is find the diary, tell the individual story and, and I wondered if you, and which is kind of a totally different approach, and I just wondered if, since we have you here at this at symposium, would you talk about that uh, sort of idea of modern violence and ways of dealing with it in relation to modern no? 
Yeah, I think, you know, the, as you said, that the, um, the, in order to confront it with the, um, the violence, I think it's always, it's better to always start from the individual level. Yeah. Um, and so if you, if you see the no, it's actually individual pain. We're always talking about, you know, the no is always talking about individual pain. Either it's the victim's pain or a perpetrator's pain. It's anyway, the pain, pain yep. in general. And it's quite interesting. It is amazing that the, uh, to discover that the Japanese people of the 14th century already understood that the best way to console the uh, victims of war or, or violence was to quietly uh, uh, listen to testimony of the victims uh, and then internalize those agonies as their own and, and speechly share the pain with the victims. Um, I mean, this is quite interesting. In the 14th century, they, they understood how to confront this pain. In order to console the pain, it's the best way is to just sit down and listen to the victim's story and internalize the pain as, 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 as if your own pain. Yep. Uh, and then build up the um, a peaceful relationship. Uh, so, um, moreover, the, these, the Japanese people of so long ago had the clarity and, and foresight uh, to transform this uh, understanding into um, a, a cultural, uh, a symbolic of art, uh, creating no a uh, combination of acting, dancing with music. So I think it's, you know, confronted with the, the mass violence, um, it's, it's, we have to explore the, how they, we can uh, uh, um, express the, the pain of the um, victims or perpetrators uh, symbolically, uh, and then uh, transformed into culture, yeah. not politics, you know, we, yeah. It's better to avoid it from politics and so transformed into cultural form and then spread that culture uh, throughout the world. I think that's the best way. I mean, it, it looks taking a long time. It takes a long time to, you know, spread this culture, establish a culture and, and spread this uh, message. But I think that's the only way we can confront with this violence. Uh, I can see no way, uh, other way to, to deal with this mass violence. Okay, thank That's, you. Yeah. yeah. So there's no contradiction really there, actually. No, no, not at all. Yeah, thank you. Any other que questions or comment? I'm also uh, one of the um, audience uh, of the of Oppenheimer, um, that was so viewing it again uh, on video. It's, it's, I felt a bit nostalgic about it. <laughs> Some years ago, we all enjoyed watching it. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry, our uh, Roman. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Just wanted to say thank you to both. Um, for a very inspiring talk. Um, I have a question for Ellen. Um, watching the No performance again after so many years really brought back uh, vivid memories from actually being there in the audience. And now I was wondering if you could make a comment on the contemporary relevance of the No theater. And uh, now that um, you know we passed Fukushima, we uh, we right in the middle of the Ukraine. Are there any plans for a, a, a future performance, perhaps? Uh, how do you see the, the relevance of the work? I mean, I, I can see the relevance, certainly, uh, of, of the work to be shown again and maybe uh, brought up to, to speed of what's happening in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Um, there have been a couple of um, uh, um, almost performances that happened. Um, the first one was actually going to be in Hiroshima, and that was where I ended up running into 
the sentiments that I described from um, uh, from one of the descendants of the Hibaksha, um, who was yeah was critical of the play on 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 a number of a number of levels, which which I understood. Um, um, but the upshot of that was that it it didn't go it didn't go ahead, and then um, uh, there was another um, possibility of, of a performance in Kyoto um, uh, until they found out how much it costs to mount an old play. <laughs> um, oh no! <laughs> though, though certainly um, there there was you know they expressed an aspiration that. In, in the future, we would be able to do this, um, but of course, COVID has um, has intervened in the meantime, and so nothing nothing much has happened. So, um, yeah, it, uh, uh, there's nothing really on the horizon. I, I guess one exciting possibility, and I, I don't know how many people know about this, um, is that the um, the Japanese garden um, in um, Kaura um, has. Uh, acquired and undertaken the um, guardianship of the stage um, that parts of which we used in that production. It was originally a stage that was made um, for a performance by um, some Kanze uh, people in 1988 at the Adelaide Festival. And um, um, we're hoping that um, at some point in the future, that stage will um, will be erected in the garden, and that we will have um, some performances for that. So, you know, Oppenheimer might be a possibility for that. Though I rather like the idea of writing a a play based around um, uh, one of the victims of the Kara breakout as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's it's um, unclear. Just one thing that the um, uh, there was a, a former Polish ambassador to to Japan, uh, I've forgotten her name, but she's a specialist on the Japanese literature, and she actually created uh, a no modern no uh, related to concerning the Fukushima uh, nuclear accident. Yeah. Um, I wanted to see that uh, performance, but um, you know it, it was played in Tokyo, I think. And I couldn't go, but the uh, and also um, you know um, uh, it's it's um, it, well it's very very interesting because he said that no uh, Japanese no players actually uh, uh, thought about it. so the making a, a modern no uh, related to the a nuclear power accident. Um, it will be a you know fascinating um, uh, topic anyway. So this. This I've forgotten her name, but the uh, probably you you could uh, Google search around and uh, Polish um, uh, ambassador, former ambassador to Japan, uh, you know or, or whatever, uh, you may find the uh, the actual uh, uh, no the title of the no. I know people who know her, so um, I, but I can't remember the name of the place. So thank you. That was terrific. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, comment? Just you know, we are getting short of time, but yes, Scott, well, there's a comment um, uh, in the chat, I think, from um, from Darren Mitchell about um, the Kara Japanese Garden um, project. It's brief, so. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to read that out? Oh yes, of course. Okay, so Darren Mitchell here um, from Kara Japanese Garden. We hope to have the North stage instated in the garden by 2026 for the anniversary of the Nara Treaty. Oh, yeah. oh. Well, uh, hello, Alan. Ah. Am I unmuted, I believe? Yeah, hi, Darren. Yes, hi, Alan. Darren Mitchell here from the Kara Japanese Garden. Um, thank you very much for making reference to it, but more particularly, thank you for the outstanding presentation from both you and Yuki about the power of uh, drama and particular the not tradition. Um, and we're very excited about the prospect of being a venue for uh, such performance uh, in the near future uh, and allied performance. And so 
not only uh, Alan's work, but also anyone who's contemplating presenting a story that relates to Australia and Japan relations uh, would be an ideal setting in Kaura for that to be performed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, that's exciting news. Yes, yeah, because we we had the uh, trouble uh, what to do with the huge and heavy uh, uh, no stage, but we fi finally found the best place to um, you know, to store at the uh, Kaura Garden. So this is a sort of uh, uh, Kaura can become a culture center uh, of this um, no performance. Right. Just now, I've uh, forgotten to tell mm -hmm. because of the mass violence that we're talking about. Um, you know, the, the very good point is the, the of noise. Every aspect of no plays intensely uh, imbued um, um, uh, with symbolism. So for this reason, uh, without re uh, enacting a horrible scene of war atrocities, like, you know, the films, uh, feature films, um, the no actors are able to convey the essence of profound uh, humanitarian messages to the audience with soul searing uh, uh, impact. That's the very good things of the no. Uh, you know, you don't see the violence, actual violence, but you can see the, the, the symbolic uh, form of the, the violence itself and how horrible uh, that it is. I think that's that's the good point, very good point of, of no. I think we should remember that. Thank you. Yes, of course. I I, I, un, I understand, of course. Yes, true. Um, there's a uh, uh, manga, for example, Roman, uh, you know, can be a graphic. Yeah, that sort of element, uh, no, hasn't. So it's a sort of um, purified in a sense really right to the core of humanity, maybe. So I would, I'd like to uh, conclude this uh, sym symposium today. And we had a wonderful uh, uh, presentations. Um, first, um, Okam Yukinori Okamura, uh, Maruki Gallery. Uh, and then we have a uh, uh, Yalata artist, and again, it's a marvelous production of their conception of uh, um, you know, nuclear testing and their suffering in the stories. It's very um, hard one to uh, listen to. And then I can, you know, sort of enlightening uh, um, you know, innovation such as, of course, humor, um, horror, and hope. And I do wish we all have a hope to, for future, of course. And then uh, the final uh, panel, that's no, it's a kind of purified symbolism, but it's, it's, it's really a attractive because in a way we, we all uh, have, a, most of people, I guess, empathy and feeling others' pain. Um, I don't know whether um, Vladimir Putin has that sympathy <laughs> or empathy. Maybe he hasn't. Right. So it's very, but as an art form, certainly no, has a sort of uplifting um, you know, uh, performance. And I like that. And again, it's an, even the manga, I, I, there is some element of. Uh, truth in it and popular to um, most of the people. And uh, we are seeing so many different ways, but um, as a collection, we are pushing forward something uh, for peace in future. So I hope today's symposium uh, showed you uh, audience and the speakers alike, um, the wealth of cultural heritage and for future. So I would like to uh, conclude today's uh, symposium. By the way, uh, as a member of the uh, organized committee, please uh, you know, comment on 
Hi, uh, Lise? Yes, I wanted to uh, remind everyone that if they want to explore further the themes of the exhibition and more detailed information about the exhibits, there's a richly illustrated catalogue with five essays, essays by some of the panelists today and by the organizing committee, um, Judith Keane, Yasuko Clement, Roman, and also that the catalogue is right up to date because there's an introductory essay on the implications of the war in Ukraine for um, the push for nuclear peace and disarmament written by Judith Keane. And that catalogue is available in the gallery, of course, but it's also available online, free to download. And I really do encourage you to, to get hold of that, if you, especially if you can't come to the exhibition. It's on the Tin Sheds Gallery website. Oh, thank you, Lise. Any other? All right. Oh, thank you so much indeed. We should um, after um, quarter past five. And thank you so much indeed. It's a memorable symposium. Thank you so much for your participation. <laughs>